As the goddess calmly greets her protag, she turns around to introduce herself, but gets quite the shock when she realizes that she doesn't have to explain the situation in its fullest anymore. This person has been here before, not even 10 minutes ago in fact. If possible, he'd like an explanation of his current predicament in around 20 words or less. This place was the space between worlds, where those who would be summoned to another world were brought without exemption. Here, they would be granted with one ability, a gift or blessing that would carry over into their travels to other worlds. Now, what do you suppose would happen if the same person visited this place multiple times? I think you see where this is going. Well, for our boy Inori, this is his second time appearing before her in the transfer between worlds, which was trending recently. The Hygen kingdom of another world had summoned them along with their classmates as heroes from another world. Or that's what it was supposed to be. The goddess has zero clue as to what's going on as this was also her first time seeing such a phenomena. Going back to the starting point after being called was quite unheard of. For the time being, she'll give him a second gift since that was indeed the rule. Protocol is protocol. She didn't quite understand, but he should do his best. And when he opens his eyes again, he's met with- Oh god no. What kind of hell is he warped into? Seeing that face first thing? The creepy old man is overjoyed that he can continue his experiments again, and he says that there's even a strong will in Inori's eyes. And this creepy old man is just starting to annoy him, and he's so close that his poking nose may touch Inori. Looks like the magic eye of restraint is working well at least. Those who were summoned from another world had a magic eye without exception, and it was his job to experiment with them. Though it appears via appraisal that he has two magic eyes, one of vision and the other of formation. But wait, hold up. As the creepy dude tells his goons to get this man on the table and to go get his tools, Inori vanishes in a blinding flash of light once more. Hold on, again? This is the third time consecutively, and the goddess is beginning to wonder if Inori didn't fall for her or something since he keeps on coming back to the same place. Not by choice, tell you that much. This was quite an anomaly, even by the goddess standards. So she would try to look into the matter further. She'll let him know if there's another chance, but for now, goodbye once more Inori. While it is partially true that what happens twice may happen thrice, he hopes for a better outcome than that this time around. Creaking open an eye to see where he's been pulled to this time, it seems that a master had been tutoring her student on summoning a person from another world. This time, the summoner is what they would call an elf. Seems her name is Rieta, and she'd summoned a humanoid demon, a vampire to be exact, and a baron class one at that. But they shouldn't take too much time oogling over him, or yep, there we go, Bye bye he tells the goddess this time that he's beginning to get sick of getting summoned over and over again, and he wants to put an end to it quickly. Well, the only way to reliably do so would be to forge a contract next time he's summoned to bind his soul to that world. There's a good chance that his fourth summoned time would be something straight out of a horror film, given how good the previous one was. But oh well, he could probably handle himself in anything he's sent to, right? Right. The goddess bids him farewell, and off he goes once again. In the next world, provided everything was Gucci, he should take things seriously for a change. As the cloud of mist and light vanishes from around Inori, he stands up and goes straight to the person thanking him for coming this late at night to their alternate world. Her name is Kana Solfia, the first princess of the kingdom of Solfia. Could he please save their world from the demon lord and whoa buddy, personal space. He gets right up in Kana's face and one of the guards tries to make him back off, but he uh, underestimates Inori's strength. It costs him his fancy armor, if not his life. There's not much time left before he disappears, and the only way he stays is if they seal a contract with him as a hero to keep his soul in that world. He's already decided that he wants to exchange vows as soon as possible, and spend the rest of his life here, and they need to do all this as soon as humanly possible. Huh? Oh, it's that time again. Ah, darn it. Better luck next time, Inori. Right as he says all this cool stuff, the dreaded magic circle appears below him once more, and whisks Inori away back to the goddess. She welcomes him back though he's a bit sulky on the fact that he almost got himself a princess. The goddess then notices something rather strange. Every time he comes back here to this realm between worlds, he strays farther and farther away from being human in the first place. Now it might be strange coming from the mouth of the person who gave him such overpowered abilities, but the goddess admits that right now he has multiple of them, enough to be considered in the state of utter broken cheating. Not only was he now something of a vampire with baron class authority, he also had two magic eyes and three modifiers to experience gain, all to his aid. Then there was skill plunder, meaning that he could gain skills on top of everything else. He's exhausted just from the thought of having to go through another trans world journey, and then he notices that the goddess has changed her clothing. Bit of small talk later in her asking if it looks good, I think it does. She then says that this was enough playing around. She would tell him her thoughts on this abnormal situation. Summoning magic basically means choosing someone with a strong soul to get slingshot between two worlds, since that strength is what keeps a person alive during the transition period. 
Why is he getting summoned over and over then? Because his soul is a rare kind of strong. And there he goes again. Fifth time's a charmer, ain't it? This time, it's a girl who summoned him with all the wheezing and coughing that you can imagine. She introduces herself as the best dark wizard in the world, Sheena. And she summoned him to inherit her magic so that they may save the world with it. She doesn't have much time left, because after 200 years and reaching the pinnacle of magic, she's exhausted herself trying to summon someone from across dimensions. If he'd be so kind as to save this world with the dark magic in her place? Nah, sorry fam, don't feel up to it. She guesses that it's natural that he'd refuse her since there was no benefit for him in doing this, beyond the usual transfer of power. He was summoned so one-sidedly that it wasn't fair to ask him to do such a thing. But there would be no other chance for Sheena either. If he agrees to inherit her magic, then he could do whatever he wanted with her body. And I'm going to leave that right there. Quite an interesting offer, but unfortunately it was still an impossible task for him. She asks why, and he simply points down. Nope, sorry Sheena, but you're all out of time. Appearing before the goddess again, she does pity the girl a bit because that world was more or less under her jurisdiction. She knows a little about her. She was sure that Sheena regretted spending the last moments of her life summoning him. Was that a hint of blame in her voice? Well, shoot. She'd forcibly exchanged the last of her half to perform that summoning, so there was no way she could do it again even if it killed her. Well, to be fair, it wasn't his fault that he keeps getting pulled back to the goddess domain here. A real pity, because if Sheena had delayed her summoning by just one day, Fate would have taken a turn for her. Speaking of fate, guess you could say Inori was also a victim of it here. Getting summoned by a whole mass of demons as their lord, and laying on the altar as something of an idol, one of them demon boys asks his vileness what kind of weapon he'll make this time. To which Inori is surprised. He has a weapon crafting system even though he's a demon lord? Oh whatever, on to the next one already. As soon as he comes back though, the goddess is somewhat concerned over the kind of being he's becoming. One look at all the powers he has, and she claims that he's got so many cheats that it's almost disgusting. She'll put all the cheats that he's accumulated into order for him since this would be the last time that he'd be summoned. As he sits down in front of the goddess, her palm glows once it touches his forehead, and she admits that this is farewell for real. It's been quite a while since she had this long a conversation with a human, and she was somewhat grateful for the errors that had transpired. It was fun while it lasted. Well, same on his part. Appearing in the sunlight in front of a bunch of people, however, it seems that the summonings have come to a close. This would truly be the last time he was called upon to different worlds. The king notes that there were only supposed to be three heroes summoned though. Why was he here? Someone rather full of themselves seems to understand the situation, telling them to be grateful that she does. Three heroes were successfully summoned, yes. But not only that, there was an ordinary person caught up in the summoning too. They'd better be grateful because she was the one who summoned them, the first princess of the Rising Sun Kingdom. Oh boy, is that going to be her catchphrase? Yup, seems like it. Now to business, there was only one thing that they wished from the people here, and that was to become a counterforce against the demon lord and his army. In this world, there were humans, demi-humans, and demons. The latter formed a country with their demon lord on top and were invading human territory. Because of that, the leader of the League of Nations called upon each country to summon heroes, raise each of the heroes in their own country, and create an army for them to go and battle the demon lord. Quantity over quality, eh? Well, is what it is. For now, they had better grow up to be heroes that won't bring shame to their country. And from that moment forth, they all stepped forward in order to gain their blessings from the stone tablet. Shinzaki Gyuto gained Limit Break, Karasawa Tamaki gained Magic Affinity, and Isugai Aoi gained Barrier Arts. Inori though gained Detection. He feels a bit like he's being ostracized, but oh well. Ryuto was able to show off his absolutely monstrous physical abilities, while the girls got extraordinary results within the test of magic. But Inori? He was completely wiped out from the get-go. His physical ability was below average, and his magical power was almost at zero from the start. That night, the heroes were all given some rooms in the magic castle, and Inori checks his status. The reason he did so bad in the physical test was because of the hatred from the sun god, a 90% reduction in daytime status and restricted skills usage. Looks like that XP multiplier from the improved growth rate also applies to skills, and the contents of skill plunder had changed a little to blood sucking, which worked well alongside it. It's now possible to steal abilities through such an act even in a world without the concept of skills. Seems the goddess kept her word about reorganizing all of his skills to put them in order. Lastly, he had the blessing of detection. Sounds oddly lame on paper, but in fact, it was quite the useful skill to Inori. He uses it on a wall and gets a clearer view of whatever lays beyond it. He can grasp the signs of people and living objects through even this kind of thick wall. Finding a maid, he uses his magic eye of vision which allows him to see anything as long as he can recognize it and now he has a perfect surveillance system for whatever may lie around him. He can even see through walls, 
Whoops. Bit too much see-through. But he can't even appraise things with it. So, her name is Nara, is it? And the other thing that piqued his interest was the skill of weapon crafting. He tried the skill without making a single noise. And thus, the first day came to an abrupt close. On day two, they are all called out to a field. They stand before Aegiana Izzy, the captain of the Rising Sun Kingdom who I'll just refer to as Izzy. Now then, they would all start their training immediately. The first three would be in guidance from the Valkyrie Corps, while Inori? Oof. My man gotta do some muscle training. He thinks that he can maybe wait for the perfect opportunity to run away, but the Knight Captain says that she must observe his training in person since he's so meek compared to the rest of them. There ain't no way in hell he can run away from the Knight Captain herself. She calls him out on his pathetic side of only being able to do 30 push-ups in broad daylight, and oh, I see what's going on here. Vampire plus sunlight. Yeah, that confirms it. But then the first princess arrives out of nowhere, coming to see how the training regiment is coming along. He'd better be grateful. She's invited to sit on a bench, and Inori wonders if her quirky habit is that she always says to be grateful, and one looks at her status window, says that it is. One of her titles is Those Who Collect Gratitudes. What the hell is that supposed to mean? And the other one, the second princess. Both of them seem to have witch's blood, but she has the trait of being a genius. But two more of her titles catch his eye, the princess of calamity and the puppet princess. They don't seem to have any names beyond their titles either. Another odd thing about this was the second princess being older in appearance than her little sister. That's quite a conundrum. That coming afternoon, it was time for the fun, fun lecture. Can you taste the sarcasm? Because I sure can. He's the only one who got a separate classroom to the other three heroes, and the reason is as stupid as you can imagine. Seems the first princess is quite a pompous little thing. He'd have to be sure to bully her someday. Then they should start the class. First of all, about the kingdom they were in, the Rising Sun Kingdom, a country established by a wizard who was a member of the hero's party, the person who defeated the former demon lord, as you'd expect so far. Since the founder of the country was a woman, a culture called Witch Faith had taken root. It was essential how deeply one had inherited the witch's blood and therefore the right to the throne, which lay among the women of the kingdom. Its special products are monsters such as the Quetzo, and magic tools were this country's specialty. Nori wakes up from his little nap to surmise that women were the dominant force in this particular country, and they had been for generations. It's now understandable as to why there were Valkyrie Corps and the Knight Captain was a woman. He does have a question so far though. What is a magic tool? Good one, boy. Well, as the name implies, it utilizes the magical power of the wielder. So this was a world where magic technology has developed quite far, is it? Then he'd guess that this pen was also a magical tool, given that he could write so smoothly with it not having any ink in. His other question is about her name. Answer, she doesn't have one. If he had to call her anything, it'd just be the second princess and no more. When a daughter of the royal family has the right to inherit the throne, her name up to that point will be stripped. That's quite a stupid rule if you ask me. The second princess was more the figure of a princess in the first place though. He wonders why, but he did feel something rather odd from her. There was a certain air that he couldn't place his finger on. Once night arrives, he's freed from the wrath of the sun god. Trying to use this time to get a grip on his new abilities, there was one thing he learned tonight. This magic eye of formation only recognized magic circles from the world he got the eye from, meaning this world's magic circles weren't saved. His ring uses some of the luxuries afforded to him in the castle to call Nara and have her bring him some papers and a pen. Then ask the color of her underwear? Uh, K then? Oh, it's the magic circle currently stuck in his eye. The only other magic circle he saw in that world was the magic circle of summoning. But because of his photographic memory ability, he can recall and reform it into his other magic eye without issue. He overwrites the magic eye of formation, and using the magic eye of vision's farsight ability, he casts summon magic outside the castle wall. He begins to vanish into thin air and appears outside the castle wall with a big swoosh. Transfer, success. Now he can go out freely and, oh, what's this? An ugly bird? A Quetzo, one of the special monsters surrounding the Rising Sun Kingdom. Its stats are pretty good for a bird, and it has plenty of sharp teeth on its hideous head. Doesn't matter much though, because Inori dodges its vicious attack and launches one of his own to counter it, using true dark magic to leap into the beast's shadow. And with that, he's gone from its sight. The beast trembles at what it's encountered, and Inori uses his control over dark magic to lift and yeet his deletus rocks at the Quetzo. Though what he can lift and control is only limited to non-living organisms. The Quetzo sees it coming, but can't escape either way, as the projectiles are remotely controlled by our boy Inori. They hit it square on the body and cause the bird to stumble. He just used his domination technique to its fullest by recognizing that he could track down the enemy with them. But at the moment before impact, letting go carries all the built-up momentum straight into his target. 
After the second princess and Izzy talk about magic tools within the castle walls, Izzy comments that she no longer truly smiles like she used to. Izzy asks what she thinks of the first princess, the current ruler and queen, and the obvious answer is chosen. Nothing bad comes out of her mouth. When asked if those are her true feelings, however, the second princess turns to the knight captain and asks what she means by that. Be careful with your words, because you never know who could be listening and who could label you of treason. Inori begins to wonder if he just got lost into this world. It certainly started feeling that way, given it had been two weeks since he was summoned here. While the other knights battle with chatter and murmurs, Inori was treated as nothing but a poor imitation, an extra, compared to the other three heroes that got summoned. The second reason was that his country, the Rising Sun Kingdom, was to put it bluntly, dirt poor. Even the sole reason for summoning people from another world was likely so they could benefit from the reward by the League of Nations. And of course, last of all, Inori, Inori, comes the second princess's voice. She's asking him to wake up again and tells him to be careful next time from getting drowsy under her tutelage. Even if he falls asleep in her class, she doesn't change her expression at all. The second princess was the one in charge of his lessons and she didn't show any emotions at all. The so-called puppet princess, who was the most boring heroine to exist compared to the ones from all the previous worlds he'd been to. That's kind of a burn to the poor little darling. Later that night when he can lie down, he laments that he's rather fluffed for getting caught up in the summoning ritual of this poor as frick country. On top of that, the princess was just like a puppet on strings. Oh, whoops, it was time. He opens the creaky old door by candlelight to greet Nara, who had come to bring him something he had requested. An eye patch which was a perfect size. Having an oddly colored golden eye was drawing him too much attention, so he decided to try and hide it away for the time being. But in any case, Nara heard that he was having lectures from the Alia-sama. Oh, beg your pardon, and the second princess. Ah, so she did have a name after all. The name of the second princess before it was stripped in the race for the royal throne. Using his advanced mental interference magic to pry more details out of Nara, it seems that the queen, who hadn't been blessed with a child in many years, feared that the royal blood would fade and no daughter would come to take her place on the throne. Thus, she ordered a concubine to have a baby for her. A girl named Alia was born, her name literally translating to the one that succeeds the throne. In a word, she was an utter genius. Although her magical talents were a bit lacking, she seemed to absorb everything and anything she was taught. Living up to her name, she tried her hardest in her little heart to succeed the throne. But then, the current queen gave birth to a real daughter, named Amanda, a simple yet ruthless story. Everything Aaliyah had worked for was suddenly gone in a puff of smoke, even her name. She was no longer the first princess, and she wasn't needed anymore. All of her efforts attributed to absolutely freaking nothing. It was a simple but quite ruthless tale of storytelling. Inori falls asleep mid-class again, and the second princess actually sighs. This time, it's a bit more obvious that she's peeved off with him. She says that he should put in a lot more effort than this. He replies that he's putting his best feet forward, and he's not the same as the other three actual heroes nor is he a genius like her. He may look like he's slacking, but nonetheless, he's still trying his best. Then change the schedule, boy. Time for some special classes to ensue. They head to the special magic training room, where the entire place was filled with the rich sensation of magic. The second princess explains that the walls of this room were highly soundproofed, and the glass on the ceiling is also special, so nobody would be able to tell what happened in here from the outside. For example, she inhales sharply and yells out at the top of her lungs scaring poor Inori to within an inch of his life. And with that, even if you were to make such a loud noise, nobody would rush in. At first, she thought she was trying to be generous enough, and kind enough with Inori's training regimen. Yet Inori, far from being motivated, just sat there and dawdled around most of the time. At this rate, he wouldn't cut it and would be banished from the castle. It's not a threat, but as the words of Her Majesty say, they have zero obligation to keep on supporting an incompetent who's not even making any effort. So, if he was thrown out in his current state, she thinks that he'd be long dead, which is why she attacks him with such viciousness. Before he's thrown out, it was time for drastic measures. She calls on him being pathetic, only being able to run around at this rate with a mere princess as his opponent. But she doesn't seem to get that if he retaliates, it'd be massively to her detriment. At first, even the guards opposed her bringing him in here alone, but they were convinced that she would do something with her own strength. Oof, so he's weaker than a princess is is what they seem to think. Is he fine with that though? Even though he can still put in as much effort as he can? Even though he isn't shackled like her? Ah, so that's what this is about. She'd been venting her emotions, her resentment against herself through him. He dodges her attack with true dark magic, and he's suddenly on her own. Then, a cackling laughter comes from behind her. She asks him what the flying fluffy did there, but he just turns around to tell her that it's a secret. 
He was just playing around, and nothing serious had been done. He sees what makes her angry whenever she sees him, what she's jealous of. He bursts into laughter at her unwavering strong spirit, causing her to call him creepy. Given those things, she's not wrong. She tells him to get away from her or she'll, she'll do what? The room is soundproofed. Among all the girls he'd seen in his previous summonings, the second princess seemed to be the most boring. But now, now she's by far the most interesting, the best girl. After a bit more talking on how strong she really is behind those eyes, the two of them leave the room with Inori showing her a glimpse of his true power. She asks him not to fall asleep in class anymore since having classes alone is quite lonely. As soon as they open the door and she's about to go back to being the puppet princess, they hear the last sound anyone wants to in this situation. The guards roaring about an enemy attack. The castle has been invaded. The person attacking them is someone with an attitude who had introduced himself to the guards earlier. Date Masayoshi, the hero. He came all the way here to have a duel. So if they could bring out Takafuji Inori already, that'd be great. The guards ask what country he's come from for this ordeal and say that he won't be forgiven for doing something like this. Not a situation to take lightly, it seems. Date gets increasingly annoyed with the guardsmen and tells them to shut the frick up. As the person he's looking for doesn't appear to be among them, he would continue his romp through the castle until he finds them. Meanwhile, Night Captain Izzy is asking the remaining guards to explain the situation. How many enemies? Who are the intruders? What method did they use to infiltrate the castle grounds? Just how many did they allow past them? How many? Um, one ma'am. His infiltration method wasn't stealthy. He just charged through the front entrance without much hesitation or challenge. Izzy sighs, quite annoyed, as this has just become the most troublesome thing in her day. And for it to happen now of all times, this day was the one where they invite heroes from other countries to an exchange assembly. Well, um, Izzy? About that. It may be hard to believe, but the intruder... No, that man. He called himself a hero. The other three heroes of the Rising Sun Kingdom come out to see what the commotion is about, and they find a hallway with Mr. Date standing front and center. Date notices that they are all wearing modern clothing, so by process of elimination, the one who must be Takafuji Inori is... the male. Going straight to the offensive, the swords clang together in a furious rush of adrenaline as Date makes it clear that he's the strong one here, the remaining guards trying to escort the two girls away from the scene. That man was a hero, and he'd come quite far to see who he presumed to be Inori, so they should have themselves quite a good long duel to celebrate their fated meeting. Date knocks back Yuto while barely using any flair, his swordsmanship being polished and without wasted movements or flashy techniques. Straightforward and savage is what they call it. His sharpness and technique-driven focus are intent on defeating the enemy, not using anything but the finest of moves to tackle his opponent. Ryuto is about to engage his limit break ability in order to deal with this post-haste, but he doesn't get the chance to do such a thing because the sword is swiftly knocked from his hand. The guards and girls alike are shocked that he could be defeated so easily, but although Date says it's over, Izzy seems to have other plans as she comes into the arena. She recognizes his blade as one from the Kingdom of Grants, and dead stops it as Date swings around to attack the new foe. Izzy won't be taken down so easily. Doesn't he think his mischief has gone far enough? She gives her full name and title of Aigiana Izzy, the Knight Captain of the Rising Sun Kingdom, and even he has no choice but to retreat in face of the sharp-witted force of nature. Said to be humanity's strongest in one of the previous panels, Izzy isn't someone he can just take down with the stroke of a blade. She's on a different level to the other people and he recognizes it, but he still vows to send her flying if she gets in his way. Vanishing to appear right above her, he brings down his blade to bear on the unsuspecting night captain, who is quick to reply with the flying flurry of slashes that almost cut Date out of the air. He's actually cut along his cheek from that very brazen attack, so he knows that this woman is now no joke. She's a legitimate threat to his goal. Because she's hella strong, looks like he's got no chance. His aura completely changes and he says that he'll have to use his blessing for the first time in a long while, or things might really get tough for him. Wait, you're telling me that he was just using nothing but pure skill here? He hadn't been using his best tool this entire time? Well, shoot. Izzy asks if he still won't lower his sword, and the answer is no, meaning that she will have to cease holding back on him. His goal is to defeat Inori, but this makes Izzy do a complete double take. If he's here to defeat that weakling Inori, then why the heck was he fighting with Ryuto? He doesn't seem to click that the guy he was fighting isn't Inori, asking who the hell Ryuto was while starting to unleash his blessing of sword arts. He'd stop dead though by the feeling of two monstrous eyes watching him from behind and above. This kind of monstrous pressure? Who or what the heck was he? Inori surprised that Date turned around, and the so-called hero is trying to rationalize that he imagined it. Inori wonders what the flying fluff is going on here, between the beat up soldiers, the frantically apologizing higher-ups from a neighboring country, and the presence of Ryuto. And finally, 
Date himself. Small note that the name Date Masayoshi is written with the Japanese characters for justice, which is quite cliche for a name. Immediately, Inori is challenged to a duel so that Date could prove that he was an unworthy person of the goddess. Uh, excuse me? What does she have to do with this? A clear white space that stretches into infinity and beyond. A refined, beautiful space where all is the same. A space that surpasses all human knowledge. This is the plane of existence on which the goddess of transmigration lives, and she lays under an umbrella in the hot sunlight with a martini at her side. Pulling off her glasses as a summoning circle appears before her, everything around the beautiful woman vanishes in a thin veil of smoke as the warping and raging light settles down, bringing with it a summoned boy destined for the same fate as all the rest. Just another day in the office, huh? This should be just a normal summoning, and it just reminds her of how atypical Inori was. Now then, to welcome the person who had come between worlds. Welcome. This space is known as the interval between worlds. I am the being you humans would call a goddess. As soon as she reaches the part where she's a goddess, he tries to say something, but falls short of his words while staring at her gorgeous figure. He tries again and finally gets the question of if she will marry him out of his mouth. Instant rejection. Wow, that came out of left field. It was a reflexive response on her part, something that came out automatically. And the man whom she had rejected was thereafter summoned to the same world as that boy Inori. And there we have it, that's the story. But hold on, there's still one itsy bitsy detail we don't understand. How on God's green earth does this involve Inori? All we know from the explanation is that the goddess had rejected him, and that he's a bloody idiot for proposing to a woman, let alone a goddess that he had just met. Date may have a few more screws loose than anticipated. Inori confirms that he shouldn't get involved with this guy, but he's told to wait until the end. The goddess lied and told him that she's happy he feels that way, but she is… well, you get the picture. He mistakes that as her having another man in her heart. She lied that in the past, there was another man named Takafuki Inori who she fell for at first sight, which is why she rejected him. If his soul becomes stronger than Inori's, she might consider him. Back in the present, Inori vows to punch that goddess if he ever sees her again. Now then, they should be done talking for the moment, right? With Inori, he was going to use his blessing from the start and get serious about beating Inori into the darn ground. But hold on now, Ryuto shows some sense and tells Inori not to let this guy provoke him. Most likely, Date has a powerful blessing, and there's the possibility that Inori could get severely injured. Of course, he's not going to get goaded into a fight. Our boy is a smart cookie. This guy was a monster who went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the night captain, something Inori could never do in his wildest dreams. However, it's not like he can't make use of the situation. He claims that he's not quite sure what's going on, but he'll accept the duel. This surprises everyone in the room, and they all beg him to rethink this bad idea because he'd get himself killed. He can't even get past 30 push-ups. Hey man, what's wrong with 30 push-ups? Anyway, Inori then breaks the tension by asking a simple question. How should they conduct this duel? Conduct? Well, yeah, in the end, Date's blessing was something powerful like a sword art. But Inori's blessing was something called detection. You can hardly call this duel between them a fair one if they were to fight right here and now. But hey, if his goal is to one-sidedly kill a disadvantaged opponent, then he could go ahead and do it right here in front of everyone. And likely in front of the goddess too. Nah fam. He's not into doing such uncouth things as murdering a defenseless man. Ah, so easy to manipulate. Alright then, how should the duel be conducted? Why, by clearing a dungeon of course. The win condition is taking out the first floor boss. With this, they should be evenly matched, at least in terms of their blessings. Just in case, they would also set a time limit as the opening ceremony of the exchange assembly tomorrow morning. So, oop, there he goes again. Inori heads into the dungeon as well, and with his detection blessing, he can't get lost within its walls. He can also proceed without encountering large groups of enemies, which is a nice bonus to his part. However, there was one point of concern to watch out for, and that was the one person following him for some reason. He quickly dupes her into going down a dead end and appears behind her. Aaliyah, the second princess. Now, what may she be doing in a place like this? Well, she came to make sure he wasn't getting himself killed. She even prepared the outfit here? Well, no, this was from the maid Nara's hard work preparing something. It certainly looks good on her though. Oh yeah, one more important detail about the dungeon. There was zero concept of day or night, no morning or afternoon. This means that he's in his full cheaty status, free from the hatred of the sun god. He'd maybe have to change his clothes too then. Going around a corner, Inori strips his clothing. She screams as soon as he comes back, but it's for moot point, as he's now fully clothed in a robe of darkness. The second princess is shocked by this development, in awe that his detection skill could be used to find things lying around like clothing on the floor. Weapon craft certainly had its uses, though if someone would tell me how clothing would be considered a weapon, I'll be grateful. He'd use the level he's gradually raised since coming to this country, and the materials from whatever monsters he'd hunted, 
in order to make it, mostly from those ugly Quetzo birds, plus the materials that he'd picked up from entering the dungeon. The jet black robe, which he'd also imbued with black magic, had an uncomfortably Chunibyo aesthetic to it. The second princess then kicks him in the back, very peeved at him for stripping in front of a woman. She's also a princess and could have him punished for treason. Oh ho, even though you're the idiot who followed him into the dungeon? And what do you think your queen would say? Anyway, he comments that her kick had gained quite some power without her wearing a skirt. Though, in turning around, he notices something very grotesque behind the princess, which is about to om nom nom her. A disgusting mass of eyes, rotten looking flesh, sharp claws, and bug-like carapace jumps at her and attempts to eat the princess whole. Using a combination of his skills, those being true black magic, throwing technique, and two weapon crafts, Inori manages to defend the princess without her even knowing there was an attack in the first place. He tells her to quit joking around here, because he was, after all, in the middle of the duel. She's now to come with him for not just her own safety, but so that he can now show her how he does things. A single hero soon arrives at the place where the boss awaits, six hours after the battle had begun. It's quite a grotesque mass of flesh and teeth, all eyes focused on Date Masayoshi. He leaps for it, drawing its blade across the boss in one foul swoop and ending its reign of the dungeon walls. The boss doesn't even know what the frick hit it, only that it's dying if not dead the moment it crossed his path. With that all settled, a bloody rain pours down on Date and he calls it such a letdown, as that was way too easy for him to accomplish. He asks himself what exactly Inori was trying to accomplish with setting things up this way, and soon we rejoin the second princess, who is returned to the castle with Inori. The second princess is greeted by the maid Nada, who is, uh, what the heck happened on the way back? Either way, she wants a bath ready as soon as possible, and Nara would prepare it immediately. Nara helps her out of the clothing, commenting on just how dirty it's gotten, and while the bath is being prepared, she asks the second princess what happened during their time in the dungeon, and where is Inori now? If it's Inori, then right now, then he's probably at His Majesty the Queen's throne room. This woman immediately looks like a nasty piece of work, with eyes that inspire fear in the hearts of her soldiers. She asks if he's who she thinks he is, and Inori answers yes. What does he mean that he'd failed this time, with his duel with a hero from another country? He'd lost with a great difference in time, he says? Yes, and this time there was no room for any excuses. The queen speaks in a voice like a grandmother, but things are as she says. In the duel this time, he'd suffered utter defeat, not even reaching the place where the boss was at. The queen finally speaks after her thoughts are complete on the matter. Up until now, she had overlooked his uselessness and his laziness. He has finally brought harm to her country though. There is no meaning in feeding the useless. Thus, Inori shall be expelled from the castle. She trusts that he has no objections to this? Um, actually, he does. First of all, her majesty had said harm to the kingdom. But what exact harm was she talking about? Yes, he lost the duel, but that's all. The bet that was placed in said duel, was she not aware of it? She didn't hear about the conditions of the duel, no. The person who won the duel would become, to a certain female, a man worthy of her time and attention. That was the only deal there was. Now, duels are a custom from the past, where if a bet were placed on one beforehand, the duel would have absolute authority. Just that, in the duel this time, there was no such thing. The loss of this time had not brought any harm whatsoever to the Rising Sun Kingdom. And to top that off, it's not like he didn't do anything within that dungeon either. Inoue throws down a bag at Her Majesty's feet, a bag that one of the guards opens for them. Her Majesty is immediately taken by this, and cut back to a few hours prior, we get a look at the dungeon Inori was crawling with the second princess. Was it really okay to abandon the duel for something like treasure hunting, asked the girl? Well, yeah. Why fight when you got a raging lunatic named Date Masayoshi already cleaning house? Time would be better spent down here looting any treasures that he could find. This was his aim from the very start. Let the dog chomp down on the tasteless victory. You'll see the bath by setting aside your shame, pleasantries, and humaneness. In other words, if the morally correct path fails, take the evil path. Even if you have to start all over again, the evil path will do. He'd do anything if it was for his own sake. They managed to collect a lot of treasure before the boss died, but there was still one remaining chest there. The second princess points it out, and when she tries to open it thinking that it'd be a waste to leave behind, well, now we know how she got covered in that stuff at least. Jumping back to the present, with the woman now happily in the bath, she's amazed at the way he manipulated the duel in order to use it as a way to explore the dungeon. By bringing back the souvenir, that is to say the treasure, he also proved the usefulness of his detection blessing to the country. To think that he'd use such a method, let alone face criticism for the loss? He even resolved the matter of himself being expelled from the kingdom. A more shrewd and somewhat mean person than she had thought. Now then, it was time for them to begin the exchange meeting between their country, the Rising Sun Kingdom, and the heroes that they had welcomed from the Grand's Kingdom. Cheers everyone! 
Although Inori had completely forgotten about the festivities, this was an event where wine, fine liqueur, and food were plentiful. A meeting between two kingdoms where the grand stars were Ryuto and the two girls, alongside Date and two more heroes from his side. But let's not forget the irregular hero in the corner, Inori himself. He's sarcastically grateful for being invited, as the plan to originally leave him out of this part was a much better one in his eyes. With his existence being recognized through the intrusion of Date Masayoshi, everything had started to point out that he was allowed to attend the party out of pity for his achievement of finding the treasure. Rather, it seems that treating him as a hero publicly is no good. It must be because he was an irregular existence that had just oh so happened to get caught up in this. Speaking of which, Ryuto and his friends had their hero-like uniforms prepared for them and everything, making them look like the genuine stars of the show. They really shine, even among the nobles present. Leaving that aside for the time being, since he had this opportunity, he should have a good look at the statuses of the heroes from another kingdom. Let's see here. Ah, hey, get out of the way! Anyhow, Tanaka Yuichi apologizes for Date's behavior. Their blessing is no. The girl, Aida Hikari, tells Date that he's the one who's supposed to be apologizing, not them. Her blessing is light magic, a funny pun on her name. But yeah, Date was the one who selfishly made a complete mess of things and caused trouble for this kingdom, right? The least he could do was say sorry sincerely. Doesn't he think what he's doing right now, sulking, is quite lame? Little Miss Flatchest is told to be quiet, his words not mine, and further insults follow. Inori concludes that his counterparts in the other kingdoms also have it rough, dealing with Date on a daily basis. And for now, it would be troublesome if Date discovered him. Oops, too late. Ida spots him with a keen eye within the crowd and comments that he's the one who fought Date, isn't he? She asks if he's really that strong, but both girls on his side tell her that he could only do 30 push-ups, and his stamina test was horrendous. He's such a weakling? And then, hold on, did Date specifically come to the Kingdom of the Rising Sun in advance, just to bully someone so weak? Uh-oh, you just triggered him. Yep, there we go. She's gone and poked the sleeping demon with a stick. Ryuto asks Tanaka if it's always like this, and he simply apologizes for the ruckus once more. I'll take that as a sad yes then. Tanaka then pokes a bit about the eye patch that Inori was wearing the whole time. Could it be that Date had injured him somehow? No, he'd been wearing that patch for a long while before they had even met. Come to think of it, under that eye patch, the color of his eye was also different. Were those color contacts maybe? Or something that could change its color, right? That was so Chunibyo, enough to make Tanaka spill the drink from his mouth. Ryuto comes to the silent realization that some of Tanaka's old scars were dug up by this, no doubt. Inori then walks into the first princess who is omnoming food from the table. She says that he should be grateful for being invited to the party and that he otherwise never would have attended. Yeah, yeah, much thanks, you little bee. He's glad that she enjoys the jewelry from the treasures that he's brought home with him the other day. Though if she was going to have a gift, she would much rather have... Um, uh, okay, that's enough of that, thought Train. Moving on, he spots the second princess and goes up to say hello. But calling her by name twice yields little to no result. Oop. She's locked into her stiffest frick puppet mode in a place like this. Must be all the nobles. But then, out of seemingly nowhere, Date comes behind Inori to grab his shoulder and ask for a bit of time. He asks Inori what he was trying to do in that duel, as he seemed to abandon it to go treasure hunting instead. Inori doesn't answer, but they both still know who won the duel. Date calls him weak and flimsy, standing up to finish the meat off his bone which he promptly eats back at Inori, who instantly dodges it as a reflex. Whoa, uh oh he showed his hand. Date smiles. Damn sly fox, he says. Inori isn't pleased with the goddess and she sneezes from it. We then learn that strength of soul is strength of the mind. Inori notices later that night that his level ups have stagnated, meaning he's no longer getting stronger. He needs a place with slightly stronger magic beasts and good XP. But what he didn't know is that in doing this, and going to a new place for the first time, his first defeat and death were waiting for him. A phantasmic jungle appeared in the unusual mountains. The space that has been hidden with powers such as hallucination and illusion got discovered by his magic eye of vision skill. What he saw in that illusion, isolated from the world of the outside, was a magnificent creature like he'd never seen before in this world, nor any other. One had tried to attack him, however, we can all guess who won that battle. But the most impressive thing that he sees while out there is a gigantic tree of flowing, spiraling wood that ascends to the heavens. He confirms that no matter how you look at it, through the beautiful waterfalls and lush greenery, this was definitely a very dangerous place. Scenery straight out of an RPG. Yup, no matter how he looks at it, this was a boss stage. Somewhere that a very dangerous animal or entity would spawn. This called for the ultimate move of trickery. Turning around and pretending not to see a damn thing. Uh, nope. Because even if you haven't spotted the boss, it spotted you. Best of luck, Inori! 
Before he knows it, his right arm has gone bouncing off to one side as what seems to be a comet races past him. He was sent flying without even knowing why, seemingly with no visible cause. When he realized it, he had slammed into a tree trunk. But that's not true in the slightest. He knows what his left eye saw. But his right eye, with its magic of vision, clearly saw something's figure. A visage of giant teeth and dog-like form. Nay, wolf-like form. A giant eye staring down at him as blood splattered every which way across his vision while the arm was torn off, white fur being a blur except the brief instant it had attacked him. This beast was something else entirely. Fenrir, the wolf-type magical beast with 40,000 HP and 12,500 MP. Stuff like that name really screams fantasy land, huh? And he's not a demon, but rather a mythical beast? Wasn't that something that appeared in the middle of a game instead of at the start? It eyes him down and asks, in no mood to be trifled with, what brings a human like him to this place? Great, he can talk. And what if he were to say that he just wandered in here like a lost little lamb? Well, that wouldn't be a total lie. He honestly had no intention of setting foot in this place. Truth be told, after he did, his detection had gone wild and hadn't been working ever since. But maybe that's because detection was a blessing from this world, meaning it could also face the same kind of power in form of an interference wave, a resistance so to speak. He got a little overconfident in his abilities here. So he killed the Fenrir's brethren and still had the audacity to say that he just magically got lost in the forest? Well, none of that mattered anymore. In any case, Fenrir couldn't just let him leave alive after learning of this place. No questions asked, eh? Since he was going to shoot to kill Inori anyway, he shouldn't bother asking such questions. The Fenrir points out that his right arm and magical weapons were already gone. So his defeat was just a matter of, oh, is it now? Inori would have to decline on that front, because he doesn't fancy dying today. His arm had started to regenerate while they were talking. Though his HP did go down, Fenrir confirms that this isn't a human he's dealing with. It's a vampire. He's way too dangerous to be left alive then. Dodging Fenrir's claw swipe, Inori is seen in the sky far above it. Fenrir looks up as Inori appraises it, finding that the enemy wolf has three times more agility, but he has the advantage over reaction speed thanks to the magic eye of vision. If he doesn't miss the first move, oh dear. Fenrir's body fur is shot out at Inori at great speeds, destroying rock and trees alike as projectile weapons. He barely dodges the Fenrir's bite as he pulls out several shadow daggers, throwing them haphazardly at the gigantic menace of fur. But it's all for naught, as they were too weak to do any form of consistent damage. He doesn't have the right cards to kill the beast right now. He'd love to use the magic circle of summoning to transfer out of here and escape, but there is just one small problem. It wasn't stocked up in his magic eye of vision right now. If he doesn't look at the magic circle of summoning, he can't switch over to it. The paper that he transcribed the magic circles on got destroyed in the earlier attack, so he can't set them up in order to escape this time. Fenrir has enough of this farce and just launches his fur to knock Inori's blades aside, destroying his body and knocking out one of his eyes. Uh oh. With one of his two magic eyes now missing, Inori might actually be in trouble for the first time. Fenrir approaches the foe that it downed, but what's this? Inori is nowhere to be found? There's only a magic circle drawn into the floor, but no body. Another circle draws itself above the wolf, one that Inori promptly falls out of. A magic summoning circle. Fenrir is shocked at the rapid appearance of its enemy, even more so that they would dare to launch an assault from directly above it. Without a second to doubt himself, Inori throws one of the daggers into the wolf's eye, which makes it scream and writhe in utter pain from the piercing. Inori picks up his own fallen eye, ill, and reinserts it into his skull, putting everything back where it belonged. His revenge was successful, and he wasn't just throwing knives around randomly. He was instead carving out a summoning magic circle in the tree. Oh ho 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 ho! Okay, I'll hand it to him. That was clever. It was a very close call, but his magic eye formation had made it in time. That aside though, he was stuck right now. The Fenrir's aura had completely changed. It no longer recognized him as any form of menial prey, but rather a legitimate enemy to its territory. Unfortunately for Fenrir though, Inori could now teleport whenever and wherever he wanted. Oopsie daisy, can't be eaten now. Vanishing high up into the air, it takes only a few precious seconds for the Fenrir to register what just happened and dash after him. But it's too late. Inori's spell is ready again, and he disappears without a trace. A draw is what he ideally wants to call that, but if they continued at the current pace, there is zero way he would have won that. Now back in the castle the day after, Inori finally admits that the one thing he lacks in the world right now was a hefty bit of firepower. The weapons and tools he's made up until now were just the products of random experiments, and they weren't the right kind of tools that he needed to take on something of the Fenrir's caliber. He needs something that suited him to a T. Second, he'd also confirmed his body's regenerative abilities yesterday, and most importantly, confirmed that the amount of damage his HP takes simply reflects the amount of flesh lost. 
so an arm would be worth more HP than being riddled with spikes or bullets. Good to know. There was a high chance that if his heart was pierced, given that his blood acted as a regenerative power, he would insta-die, a very vampire-like weakness. There's a second weakness for vampires as well, according to research done of this world. Their weakness is mithril. However, to him, the weakness is silver. He was turned into a vampire in a completely different world, so the rules differ a bit. He's leveled up countless times in a world without the concept of levels or skills by robbing others of those same things that they didn't know they had. His skills and knowledge actually might just defy the rules of the world he's in, courtesy to him being summoned through multiple different worlds. He'd like to test his abilities and traits again, so tonight he would return to that place one more time and test his cheats again. Now that he's figured out a bit more about them through hard research work, he'd be sure to kill that Fenrir with his own hands. Going back to the forest in a full moon, we now learn that this is a place under a witch's pact. In exchange for her safe haven, they must exterminate anything that brings terror to this land. So, Fenrir was the reason there was nothing but Keichios in the forest. It must be the type of wolf. But yes, exactly. Though Inori was still alive, which was an unforgivable sin, Fenrir could not forgive itself for letting him escape that one time. So tonight, Inori would have to die. When he's come back fully stocked and knowing what to expect? Yeah, good luck. But as Inori bobs and weaves through the attacks, something new comes out of his shadows. Something that the Fenrir should very easily recognize by their sense of smell. No, that's impossible. It couldn't be. It's precious brethren? Well, ain't that sad. Those guys were its brethren at one point, but they belong to Inori's dark magic control right now. They were no longer one of his clan. With Fenrir now blinded, it attacks relentlessly and doesn't bother trying its luck at tactics any longer. Destroying the forestry it's meant to protect, the beast thrashes new holes in its own land, and as Inori so boldly puts it, it's coming with so much force that it feels like it wants to turn the entire area into a wasteland. It doesn't appear to be pulling any more punches. It also has the leeway enough to do so. So far, everything was going just as planned. As he ducks and bobs through claw swipe after claw swipe, he uses his familiars in order to attack properly, and the Fenrir asks how long he's planning to keep this up. Inori isn't indestructible though. He also takes a few solid hits and gets put down harshly, such as when his ribs snap and pierce his organs, his torso gets crushed flat, and he begins to puke out blood. However, because it's not like he's losing any body parts, that's equivalent to zero damage for a vampire like him. Plus, he has an ace in the hole for situations like this. He can still teleport around. The Fenrir won't let him run away that easily though. It's a great emergency exit skill, though it eats up a lot of mana. Thus, while saving some for the way back, he'll need to fight back efficiently. Throwing his sharpened knives of darkness, the Fenrir sees them but can do little about it, as he's cut cleanly through the tough fur. Inori notes that the cuts from the new knives he'd made with weapon craft were a bit shallow, but they were indeed injuring the Fenrir. If they got stuck in too deep, he wouldn't be able to pull them out, so this was still fine in his plan. The Fenrir doesn't sit idly though. It attacks with all its might, shooting tufts of its body fur at Inori and injuring him, but not severely enough to be of any real danger. He actually thanks the Fenrir for the attack, as because of it, he was able to gain some altitude just now. At this rate, he was going to get away. The beast gets ready to jump, using its powerful muscles to leap high towards the full moon hanging over the desolate black sky. Just as it's about to eat Inori up though, teleport is used to get away, and the sly vampire pulls out his master plan. One of the familiars pokes its head out of the shadow. Fenrir hasn't caught on yet, but it's too late for the mangy mutt to earn a victory. Shrink, Gleipnir, calls Inori. Suddenly, the forest is abuzz with activity, and chains of all manner close in on the giant wolf, ensnaring it like a hare in trap. It can't break free of them no matter the attempts made with its great strength, and Inori explains that he tied the chains around the trees within a 300 meter radius. The force is equally dispersed around the tree trunks that way. If it can't break through these chains, then it has absolutely zero chance at even a glimmer of escape. The giant wolf asks when he was able to do such a trick as this, and Inori says that he can freely manipulate those whom he controls, even erasing their scent. Above all, he owns the shadows of those he dominates, or in other words, it's connected to a spatial shadow. From the shadow knives that he'd spread during the fight, which were also connected to said shadow, he could control things remotely. He used himself as bait, teleported to the sky, and bought himself time to set up the trap. These chains also have slash resistance, so it wouldn't be able to rip them apart with just its claws. Now then, thank you for the meal. Takumi levels up 5 times after that, straight to 13, and gains a bunch of new skills along with a unique one that Fenrir used to hold. His shadow familiars can now converse with him, and they ask a favor of their new leader, a wish that they wish granted as a humble request. You see, Fenrir used to protect them all with its life. It would always fight for the sake of its brethren. They ask if he's planning on killing their former brethren in the forest, 
and when Inori says yes, he's asked if he can instead take them all as his subordinates. Given that Fenrir did want to protect them all, it's fair to say that they don't want their comrades and paws to die for nothing. There's no real benefits to him to do so, but there's no drawbacks either. And as familiars, they won't need to be fed. They could even become powerful weapons. Alright then, he'll spare them by request. The wolves thank him endlessly and Inori decides that now might be a good time to return home to the castle before daylight hits. Sucking Fenrir's blood took quite a lot of effort, as well as putting this giant black wolf in a spatial shadow. Wonder if it'll turn back if it's made into a familiar at some point. Getting back to the castle and flopping into bed, Inori wasn't exactly sure how long he'd been out. But he knew one thing. He wasn't going to stay awake in class this time around. Poor second princess. Inori is asked rather bluntly by Knight Captain Izzy. Does he want to join the Knights Association? Wait, what? Sitting in a fancily adorned room with her, he's popped the question seemingly at random. He doesn't even know what the Knights Association entails, much less what he would be required to do by joining such an organization. He thought he was getting called in to get thoroughly scolded for something beyond his control, but instead, he got scouted for one of the most prestigious jobs in the entire country over a cup of tea? Izzy stops drinking for a second to think of what to say. His duel with the hero from the neighboring country canceled his exile from the Kingdom of the Rising Sun, but that was only a temporary fix for the moment, wasn't it? She puts down her cup and stands from the table, walking around it in order to stand next to Inori. Ah, now he gets it. She was offering this since he, as a hero, couldn't stop the Demon Lord's army. He's not a legitimate hero, meaning the hero treatment this country provides will eventually end, and thus, she would be willing to reassign him as a knight, a job other than a hero. Izzy would tell him something important first. Leaning over, she says that it's not as if she doesn't appreciate him. In fact, she thinks his abilities could prove very useful in the future. Oh? Does that surprise him? Yes, a little bit. Everyone else in the entire kingdom, the queen, and both princesses included, seem to think that he's basically a useless deadweight of a man. Truthfully in training, he's always pointlessly working hard. They thought that he couldn't keep up or something of the like. Well, if he didn't have that, he would immediately fall asleep, so that helps in a way. He records the other heroes training with his photographic memory and trains himself at night. Anyhow, he can't decide things immediately, however tempting the offer may be. Izzy then says that if he runs out of options with nobody else to turn to, he can come to her. You'll remember that. Nowhere else to turn, huh? In other words, if he gets exiled. Then a knock on the door comes. Izzy tells them to enter and what do you know, it's Ryuto. He's come because he had heard that Inori was here. The first princess is calling for him to appear in her room by himself. Uh, bro, you do something we're not privy to? Even he's shocked at the development. On the walk, Ryuto truthfully admits that he was the one who suggested that the first princess speak with him. She's taken a liking to Ryuto, and recently has become more and more honest with him. He wants Inori to help too. Of course, she immediately tells him to be grateful that she went out of her way to speak with him. Yeah, some greeting that is. It's annoying enough to make him want to leave instantly, but out of the humor in his heart, he stays for her. Incompetent him has to borrow Ryuto's dignity like a goblin borrowing an ogre's power. Oh well. She finally gets to the point and says that he seems to be quite close to the second princess. He had already heard quite enough of the details on the situation on the way here from Ryuto. The first princess wants to make amends with the second princess for... Oof. Can you listen without having such a dark and gloomy face, my man? Of course this won't come for free. Ryuto would try to find a way to get him into the next party. The first princess's birthday party, which he hasn't heard heads nor tails about. What this boils down to is the first princess wanting the second princess to call her sister, and she wants to be treated as a sister. He kind of understands the troubles, even with a sigh coming out of this. Basically, she wants to make up and be called her sister, but she doesn't feel like talking to the second princess about all of this, even if she dies. Very well, he'll encourage the second princess into this himself, and he'll make a chance for the first princess to make up with her. So when that time comes, she'd better respond honestly as well. Should everything go well, she would be grateful to him for the first time. He questions the second princess about the party, and she says that if he wasn't invited, then it wasn't necessary to tell him. Nara interjects that there was not a need for him to join the party though, and it's not because he didn't deserve it. It's more that it's not worth the effort for him to join. Nara obviously has zero clue why the first princess was doing this right now, but that's not the important factor in this decision. What is the important factor is what the second princess wants to do with this. Well, if that's what the first princess thinks, or more importantly what she wants, then... The second princess thinks for a while before responding. She would like to respond in kindness. Sitting on the fancy sofa amid a sunlit room, that is what she thinks. Remembering all the times where she was held in high standard, to the time her sister was born, to all the times that the first princess got all the praise after she was cast aside and forgotten. Needless to say, 
she was still a little bitter on the inside about all these feelings. Now, what in the world were they doing in the town of commoners? This wasn't part of his normal regiment. Well, as Nara states, getting to know the streets and market prices of commodities on them was also an important study in the eyes of the second princess. Today's lesson was not on the kingdom's history or fight training, but rather on social studies. She asks the second princess if that's correct, and indeed it is. She had used the magic tool to change her hair color so that it looks like Nara and her were sisters from birth. Secretly sneaking out of the city in order to shop, this time the goal was about the first princess's gift, wasn't it? Surrounded by many buildings the likes of which he'd seldom seen outside of fantasy novels or RPGs, it seems that Inori understands and will adjust to such a setting as the one he's been put in. Now for the meat and potatoes. What was his role in all of this? The two of them can't seem to agree on what he should be. So in the end, they just resigned to him being some kind of bodyguard for them. Wandering around the town to various stalls, they eventually come across a merchant's shop where a lot of jewelry items are on display. It seems that just by eyeballing them, the second princess can't decide between two accessories for her sister. Well, while it was true that he had met with her the other day, that doesn't mean that he knows her inside and out. They had only just met properly yesterday other than passing glances since his accidental summoning. She points out that he's rather good at understanding people's emotions though. Eh, you're looking at this a bit too closely. Well, unfortunately, it was a bit different than what she was probably expecting. Yes, he can understand emotions, but that doesn't mean that he can automatically empathize. He'd been like this for a very long time. He can't empathize with people's joy nor their sadness. The only concrete thing he can sense is that they have it. Ever since he had a painful experience when he was a child, he's worked hard to try and understand it, but he could only grasp the logic of the situations in the end. He legitimately does not have the faintest clue what could make the first princess happy. Oops, he'd gone and made the mood quite heavy now. Not being able to empathize is also just because he has no interest in the subject of emotions, which was fair to a point. Changing the subject of things, he asks if her expression isn't a bit stiff right now. She perks up and stares at him with a bit of worry growing on her face, asking if that's the truth. Well, yeah, today you're supposed to be a normal girl in the middle of shopping away for jewelry and gifts for a friend, not the puppet princess of the kingdom of the rising sun. To that effect, she cheers up a smidgen and grabs his hand, going around the store with a more genuine smile put on her adorable face, pleasing both Inori and Nara. By the end of the day, they have a gift ready for the first princess, and Inori comments that she had picked a really good present. She doesn't know if the first princess will accept it and be happy, no matter what she gives at this point, since she's so used to being given presents. But hey, there's always the worth in trying. Inori notices her tension and sighs. She's used to receiving presents from complete strangers, yes? Well, if the second princess carefully chose what she wants to give her sister, then it's all good, isn't it? Indeed, Nara points out that Inori is quite the kind man when he wants to be, and he says that he didn't mean it like that but he's changing the second princess little by little for the better thanks to his actions. Until now, things like this wouldn't have been possible. Nara gave up on presents until last year too. She smiles under shadow and then whispers, if you can't do it at a temple, then it's considered heresy, right? Not entirely sure what she means by that. That night in the depths of the castle under the moonlight and candles aplenty, we go down a set of spiral stairs and into the dark bowels of the castle's underbelly. A mysterious voice asks a few questions and Captain Izzy enters a dark room with another person sitting across from her at a giant table. Five days later, one of the maids is doing up the first princess's hair, and the party is held as planned in a great hall venue. Well, held mostly as planned. Inori was partaking within the position of some kind of butler. Today's star actor was the birthday girl herself, whom Ryuto compliments in front of the entire crowd. In the seats at the front stage of the assembly hall were his and her majesties, the king and queen of the nation, along with Commander Izzy, and a little farther away, a plump old man. When his status was looked at, he seemed to be this country's prime minister. So that's the kind of place he was in, a large-scale party where all the most important people of the kingdom came crawling out of the woodwork in order to congratulate the first princess on her birthday. But now comes the hard part, the operation. Make up with a present. Tamaki and Aoi, the two girl heroes besides Ryuto, wonder if things will go well for the moment. Inori can tell that they're all worried, and turning to the second princess, she's also terrified of going up to her little sister to give the gift. Her usual dull smile is nowhere to be found, instead replaced with a nervous one and spirals in the eyes that signify anxiety. He approaches her in order to ask if she's okay, and to see if she really is nervous about this. She was shaking despite saying that she's okay, and he wonders for a moment if they shouldn't have done a rehearsal beforehand. Well, it's not like he doesn't know. It seems very difficult to barge into the middle of all the people surrounding the first princess at the current moment, all giving her the finest of gifts. When it comes to it, it does seem like she was a bit nervous to start the interaction. First of all, how should she greet them? 
Inori has an idea for this. Aliyah, I choose you. He shoves her into the middle of the crowd with one foul push, saying that she's wasting his day off too. It would be troublesome if she didn't succeed as well. Now surrounded by the nobles and in front of her baby sister, the second princess musters up her courage and wishes the first princess a happy birthday. The birthday girl awkwardly says that they are grateful that her sister could participate in the party today. And then comes the part where a present is offered. She chose something that would fit the first princess, but the nobles and their snarky voices fill the room, even though the birthday girl is excited for her new gift. She does hesitate a bit at taking them thanks to this, but she looks up and sees that the second princess's hands are shaking. She orders her maid to put it on for her, and through the shock, she repeats the orders. The maid doesn't trifle with her majesty and does as she's told. She looks quite cute with those new ornaments, not going to lie. Ryuto says that it looks very pretty, and the first princess then asks for another gift. Could she call Aliyah Onesama from now on? The tension in the room skyrockets for a brief instant, until the second princess says, Sure, I would love to. Mission accomplished! The two hug it out and have some fun amidst the huge crowd, and Ryuto thanks Inori for his hard work in getting everything prepared for this. Of course, his success rate was 90% after all. He would be taking this extra reward as well, and Ryuto would be sure to tell them all about it. Now, later in the party, the king and queen are approached by someone. They had seen something good, yes? Ask the prime minister. And now, he had nothing to regret. Without a second thought, he decapitates the two of them in broad daylight, claiming that they were children of the witch. To rely on ignorant people from another world to solve their problems was outrageous. The second princess tries to use some magic to blast the guy away, but it's literally cut in half by Captain Izzy. The prime minister and a few guards proclaim that there's only one hero who their witch had worked for, and the foolish queen, the king who didn't stop them, and the girl who summoned them, they went against the witch's will. And for that alone, they will die. This country was corrupt. Not just the royalty and nobles, but the entire system itself was corrupted. Everything ought to change in order to make this country shine brightly as it once did. As the second princess looms over the head of her now dead sister, and Ryuto holds the rest of the corpse, time seems to slow down. The prime minister uses the attention that he's garnered in order to rise the tension and then turns to the guards. Those who would follow the witch with them, don't let the nobles, don't let the corrupt people here live to tell another lie and trample on the name and land of their witch. They were to capture the other world savages, all four of them. The guards spring to action and their blades begin rending flesh from bone in gruesome ways, slicing into the nobles' faces and torsos. Inori now knows that his hunch was right. This country was very much in danger, and he'd felt this for days, ever since he was summoned. The people there were poor. The nobles couldn't stop wasting. They even summoned heroes in order to deal with other countries. It was inevitably going to fall flat on them. Thus, he was as cautious as he could be in this situation. But what he didn't expect was a coup d'etat at a time like this on the first princess's birthday party. In the middle of their financial crisis, the reason the people were unified was because of faith in the witch and her lineage. Yet now that the queen and the king have been killed, the first princess, next in line, has also died. This was the end. At least, the Rising Sun Kingdom they had known up until now had come to a striking end. One of the nobles yells out to ask why they were being killed as well, as it would have just been better should they have murdered the other world savages. Why the nobles too? Because within this ceremony, there was embezzlement, bribery, waste, excessive taxation, discrimination, and the works. The people who corrupted this country, along with the royal family, were the only ones who were invited here. There was zero value in keeping the people here alive. With this, Ryuto completely loses it and puts down the corpse of the first princess. Using his ability of limit break and summoning a light sword, he clashes with Captain Izzy. In a bold frenzy, he yells, there's no way people who deserve to die exist. One of the hero girls snaps out of her trance, and in a frenzy, she casts light machine gun on a corrupted guard, about to decapitate the second princess. She screams over to Inori that she'll make an exit for them, but he needs to get the second princess, now the first, out of here and to safety. I'll be calling her by name, Aaliyah, to avoid confusion. Another guard appears behind the hero girl and yells that if the heroes get in their way, they won't just be captured. The other hero girl works together with her on defense with her barrier hearts, and Inori grabs Aaliyah in order to drag her out of there by a bit of force as she's still in shock. Somehow, the two of them escape the room, and the Prime Minister asks if that means they've completely escaped. I don't like the sound of that. Inori had used detection out in the hallways to confirm our hunch. No wonder they let them leave that room so easily. The entire castle had been taken over. They were in the palm of the enemy's hands, dancing like mice with cheese at the exit. 
Inori explains that now that the rest of the royal family is dead, she's the only reason they can't see sovereignty. Aaliyah replies back that the Prime Minister, Badly, has royal blood. He's a distant relative of the former royal family. Inori considers their options and says that there are two options they can realistically take right now. Run away and live another day, or give up and die here and now. There was also revenge, but that was basically a death wish in the making, so nothing new. Aaliyah expresses the desire to kill the Prime Minister with her own hands, but for now, she'll choose to run and live another day. The two of them catch two guards unaware, choking them both out with a little magic until they're unconscious on the floor. This is thanks to a spell called Air Hole, which is practically a local vacuum in the casted space. This was the result of using it alongside detection. They kill both the knights, and Nori feeling absolutely nothing at the prospect of murder, maybe because he's a vampire who's seen much of it, and they continue down a path known only by the royal family, an escape route. There were no knights ahead if they went this way, towards the servants' quarters. However, there was no shortage of corpses, including that of the poor Nara. As Nara's body is held close to her former master, Aaliyah can't help but cry at the lost friendship at the hands of their foes. She weeps continuously with Inori at her side, the man who finally realizes that up until this point, she probably wasn't able to get Nara out of her head. If they had prioritized rescuing over escaping, perhaps they could have saved her. Though given how they had planned this out, you think they would have murdered the servants in advance. This also wasn't a good mindset to be in. He had told Aaliyah she had two choices, but in truth, he also had two. One involved waiting until sunset, when he was free from the wrath of the sun god. Once that happened, they were free to break through the siege, either by escape or by teleporting out. But the other choice was the polar opposite, and it's one he didn't think Aaliyah would like very much, joining the Prime Minister. He's not a hero, and more importantly, his face isn't known to the public. Above that, he holds this handy little skill called detection. He then remembers Commander Izzy's invitation to join the Knights Association. When he had nowhere else to turn, come to her. Now that he thinks about it, this is what she was talking about. Good foreshadowing. The downside to joining them is that his actions would be restricted. Preferably, he'd want to avoid military service in any capacity. It should be saved as a last resort option for when they have no choice. In that situation, if he sells at Aaliyah, he may be able to gain some credit to his name. But first, he has to see how Aaliyah would move. He warns her that he doesn't mind her crying, but there is nowhere to run within this room. He wants to leave before the knights come to clean up the area. Aaliyah asks if they were going to leave Nara here in this condition, and the answer is an unfortunate yes. To himself, Inori thinks that if her heart breaks here, or her regret later affects her in battle, when the time comes. She breaks his train of thought by calling him strong, saying it almost like she has a grudge against him for it. Maybe because his lack of reaction to a death made her cogs turn a bit. 50 minutes left until sunset, Aaliyah, with her eyes closed, said a silent prayer to an unknown deity, perhaps the goddess of transmigration in a funny twist. She mourned for the casualties for a little while. Inori could understand, but couldn't empathize. Whether the corpses were mourned for, decomposed, or even got eaten alive, they were nothing but lumps of useless flesh to him now. My dude, being a vampire fits you perfectly. Aaliyah finally gets up from her silent prayers, and they go, together, out the door for greener pastures. She thanks Nara for everything, just one more time, having laid her corpse to rest in a respectable position. As long as Inori doesn't neglect detection, he'll try and investigate the situation in the main hall with clairvoyance. Good god, that's a ruthless scene. Ryuto is facing off against Commander Izzy, and he's asked what he's trying to accomplish here. Avenging the first princess? Does he resent her contempt for the dead? Did he want to keep his friends from dying? Or maybe, just maybe, did he want to stop them? Nothing makes sense anymore. That is why he's falling apart. Ryuto uses Light Sphere to try and blind them all, and it works. On everyone except Izzy, who simply grabs him and slams him into the floor. She could still fight even if she couldn't see. He was naive for choosing to try and blind a trained soldier. He doesn't even have the resolution to kill anything, provided he could even blindside Izzy in the first place, which was an impossibility in and of itself. Woman ain't called the world's strongest for nothing. Hold on now, did the limit break effects wear off on his body? Well, that's what you get for forcibly increasing your own physical capabilities. He can't even move his body anymore, much less fight in that condition. The guards bear down on him as Izzy walks away, saying that she'll drag them all to the dungeons herself. Wanting more information on the two people leading this charge, Inori had gotten some details out of Aaliyah while they were walking the castle halls. First off, the captain was the strongest woman in the world, and held that title proudly and skillfully over everyone. Her involvement in this meant that no amount of brute forcing it would work. They needed a plan. 
The second person, the Prime Minister, was also a notable soldier with 10 years worth of experience behind him on the grounds of battle. He'd gained remarkable power during this time. It seemed like Aaliyah was hoping that the heroes would make it through the palace to join her, but no such lucky thing would ever occur with the captain roaming around. That possibility just went up in smoke. He doesn't plan on sharing this with her, of course. The last thing he needs is a princess with nerves deep fried in worry. Using detection to ping the place, he then tells Aaliyah to stop where she is, because 15 paces beyond the bend were two guards on a collision course. They'd probably noticed the two of them by now, so there was no escaping. His stealth skills during the daytime were next to nothing, and Aaliyah at best could hide in a group of people. This was eventually going to happen. They had no choice but to fight their way through. But the question hinging here, could it be done? In reality, Inori fighting right now would be a disaster. They had to rely on her skills to get them through this. They could fight at least. She makes a smoke screen in front of the guards who then recognize them as an enemy, and Aaliyah leaps over them using a magic circle to double jump. Inori uses external vision with one of his eyes to check what's going on behind the scenes, and it appears that she's used air jump in order to vault over the smoke screen and get behind them. Due to the level of difficulty in pulling such a maneuver, it was nothing but pure acrobatics, but it's enough to let her use shock bolt to knock them out. See, while their armor is resistant against magic, that only works when they create a barrier ahead of them. It leaves their backs completely open to attack. All Inori can do at this point is clap for her and congratulate her. She looks at him with a bit of contempt, but it's not like he'd have been much use in a fight right now. They were almost at the hidden passageway, so they needn't bother with finishing off the knights they left behind. They're on the last bend of the journey, and now they just have to leave the palace and open the door to the underground tunnel. Um, one problem with that, Chief. They were being ambushed. Escape was now impossible, according to detection. He tried to ping every other escape route with it as well, like a walking sonar, but the result was the same. For Aaliyah, this was close enough to a death sentence. She falls to the floor, gloom overtaking her eyes and her emotions finally stirring up from their graves. Inori knew this was going to happen. He knew, but he never said anything, and now they were trapped in a stone corridor between a rock and a hard place. There was no getting out of this easily, if at all. All her emotional damage from her mother's death, her father's death, and her sister's death had all piled up, and now she'd reached her breaking point. Inori sees no way out, but wants to leave his options open until the last minute. He picks up Aaliyah bridal carry style, and she asks him gently to put her down. She'll walk, no, run by herself. But even if she ran, where would she run to? There is no more escape routes. Looking up at Inori with panic set in her eyes, she asks what she should do repeatedly. He lies and tells her that earlier, he eavesdropped on a knight's conversation with detection and that another force was heading this way to aid the royalty. She asks if there's still hope then, and says that they're going to be saved. Right? Right? The lie continues that it looks like reinforcements are planning to break in at sunset. If they can survive until then, they may have a chance. She grabs onto Inori's jacket arm and immediately asks what they should do. Where should they go? She repeats herself endlessly, hoping for an answer. But Inori just gets colder and colder with every reply. The reinforcements were meant to be a lie to give her hope but he got a completely unexpected reaction. Aaliyah's emotional strength is already in the gutter. She's clinging to him and asking for orders at every turn, begging to know when sunset is. He was hoping for stronger people, but in the end, she entrusts her life to him. She's not even a human anymore. She's just, well, a puppet. Sad to see, really. He tells her to take the left turn at the end of the hall, but that's, no, never mind. She'll just do it and trust him. They finally reach it, and as the guards in Inori points out, ahead of them is nothing but a dead end. Who designed this place? But no, this was just fine, for they could avoid a pincer attack here. 15 minutes left until sunset. The rest will depend solely on Aaliyah. Good luck being his shield until then, fair maiden. He disappears into her shadow and Aaliyah is left stunned when she is all alone in the hallway. And Nori was just… gone? She calls out for him in vain as thundering footsteps plague the halls, and the enemy guards ask what, or who, the second princess is screaming for. 14 minutes, 49 seconds left. She survives on her own, until 6 minutes and 30 seconds when we tune back in. The hallway is now rife with cracks, and the soldier's blades are getting chipped from continuous wear and tear on the spells that Elia puts up. She just barely dodges getting impaled through the head by one of the blades, and this leads the guards to question what she's trying for this late in the game. How long have they been fighting like this? Well, few minutes at best. All their swings at her were being deflected by magic barriers. Their weapons were magical, so it was impossible to keep receiving strikes head-on like this. Yet this girl kept on fighting for her life. 
We learn that she strengthens each barrier and pulls it back to a minute scale to compensate for the extra rigidity, which is what has been keeping her alive this long. Hit diagonally and deflect. That is how she has survived. It's a skill that she built up and perfected over years of training and exercise, a skill likely only she can use. The guards yell to just give up and die already, but she doesn't want that. What Aaliyah wants is to live. She wants to survive until sunset. If she can just survive until sunset, then everything would fall into place. She would be saved. She had to be saved. And Nori said she would be. Her mind begins to fragment on the spot. She hears herself and her own thoughts telling her that Inori has long since abandoned her and is just using her right now. The guards are confused at what she's saying because it's starting to fall off into the realm of nonsense. She avoids their attacks and they begin to wonder if she really is the puppet princess. One of the guards reports to his superior that they have her cornered in a dead end and they're told to bring in the troops with guns already. They don't have to worry about stray bullets in a place like that. That boy they have to keep alive wasn't there, right? Needless to say, the guns pack a lot more of a wallop than sharp metal sticks, and they're enough to graze and damage Aaliyah. She can't defend against projectiles that break the freaking sound barrier. One of the guard captains has a large-scale spell ready in the palm of his hands, and he prepares to fire it at her, saying that since she was still a part of the royal family, her last moment should still be gracious. Fire lands his shot, and she somehow manages to block it, though at the cost of a lot of her magic and almost damage to her limbs. Her clothes got singed, but she managed to dodge it, a slash was coming from above on the left, deflected downwards to the right. Oh no, she ran out of magic. Compress more barriers, reduce the magic, work with whatever she has left. The voices try to dissuade her from living again, saying to just give up fighting and give up on trusting someone like Inori who had left her for dead. And part of her knew all along that he was lying, that he was just using her. She's just clinging to hope at this point. Two minutes, nine seconds. The guard captain orders that from now on, they taunt her while attacking just to break her mind that little bit further. What they insult her about doesn't matter. Talk about the first princess who died gruesomely for all he cares. 31 seconds left. She can't hear the reinforcement yet. They're not coming. She's lying to herself. If she can just hold on a little longer, maybe they'll come. No, they won't. 21 seconds. They even broke her mind? Wow. Now hurry up and dispose of her, roars the guard captain while laughing at the princess's anguish. Soon she'll hear footsteps. Soon she'll hear the overwhelming thunder of her own people coming down the hallway soon. Soon her eyes would close, because without concentration left, she gets slashed straight across the stomach. Aaliyah spits up blood, seeing the ground stone in its dusty color. Seeing her own guts spill out onto the floor, seeing her own blood on her hands, coughing it up. 11 seconds. Her stomach hurts, and she uses healing magic to try and patch herself up. But she has next to no magic power left. She wants to live. She wants to live no matter what. Seven seconds. In order to be free, in order to run at her own leisure, she wants to live. Four seconds. The voices get louder with every snarky remark, and one of the guards yells that their dream is about to come true. Zero seconds. The hallway suddenly goes completely dark, and the guards all fall one by one as the candlelight is blown away by a very gleeful Inori. Blood. That's all that some of the guards see in their final moments. Their limbs are torn off one by one, and many of them panic as a monster rages through their ranks, ripping morale to shreds along with every single one of them. Inori's chains bind the unlucky, crushing them between the links of deathly black in gruesome fashion. Some scream, many resign to their fate, but all experience the pain and suffering of the vampire's wrath. Once the hallway is cleared, Inori tries to shake some blood off his boots, only then noticing the half-dead Aaliyah. She was still alive? Just barely. She really did amaze him. Even muddy and unconscious, crawling on the ground, she had survived the near impossible and clung harshly to her life. Outstretching his hands for a few claps, Inori notes that her MP and HP are decreasing at the same time. She's using the last of her magic to cling to life, a constant healing spell that keeps her on death's doorstep. Frankly, the difficulty of escaping with a half-dead princess was as high as things got for him. He contemplates his actions for a few moments. Especially with the state she's in right now, lying across the cold, dark floor of the dead end they found themselves in, with a whole host of murdered guardsmen laying right before her? 15 minutes total. How on God's green earth did she survive that long without breaking? Aaliyah breathes lightly, still trying to keep herself together. Her family was killed, her place to belong was now gone, and even her closest maid had gotten herself killed in the middle of it all. She was even deceived by Inori, who she thought was an ally. 
He wondered how many times the corners of his mouth would naturally rise. He sees a spark of life behind those eyes. Even when everything was taken from her, she still struggles to live. He asks if she can hear him, and then asks a few questions. First of which is does she want to die like this, or does she want to live no matter what? His shadow crawls behind him, reaching out in jagged spikes and screaming faces. There will be a risk to it, but that can't be helped because she's interesting. He can keep her alive, but there will be a few requirements. First, is she a virgin? Ah, this is related to the vampire trait, I take it. Truthfully though, even from the smell of her blood without an answer, he can tell right away. It smells different to that of Nara, so it was possible to turn Aaliyah into a vampire at least. Secondly, if she were to be saved, she would submit to him entirely. Simply put, she would become his complete slave. She wouldn't be allowed to live as a human. Well, she can interpret that as she wishes. She then asks a very good question of him. Why would he save her, like, at all? He abandoned her to fight all those people by herself, and now he's offering to spare her life? Well, put simply, no reason. He's just really bored right now. There wasn't much time left, so she had to make her decision here and now. Save her because she's interesting? She wasn't just some random toy for him to throw around. Until now, she had lived tied to this damn country, and now she was being told to live tied to him? He could leave her then, as asking someone who used to help her, that would just be humiliating. Even if she threw away her humanity, she wanted to live. Inori laughs a bit to himself, cackling while saying that she has a good attitude. Of course, even if she sold her soul to the devil, she wanted to live. Devil? That was a bit crass, but it wasn't wrong either way. He was closer to being living Satan than he ever was to God or the angels. He leans down with fangs bared, biting into her neck, causing Aaliyah to jerk and move around in a bit of pain as her body regains some of its former luster. Once done, one of his wolves appears before him, asking for any kind of orders that he may have for the pack. He orders them to please watch this girl, stating that just the three of them should be enough to defend her. When she wakes up, Aaliyah's transformation into a fully-fledged vampire would be completed. But until then, she was nothing more than a squishy human. That's also provided her body didn't resist, but at least the transformation itself was a success. In the end, he's working together with the princess who was once scorned by her entire kingdom. The poor girl would hopefully be put to some good use as his new slave. But then Inori considers that people working for the prime minister would probably come to dispose of Aaliyah. Running away from them would be bothersome to say the least. So preferably, he'd just get rid of the need to escape. Ordering more of his familiars to go down a hall, his plan of action has now been decided. Murder everyone in the castle. Being put in a cage, the three heroes of the once rising sun kingdom are told that it'd be best if they didn't struggle. The prison they were in is resistant to not only magical attacks, but physical ones as well. There was no chance in hell they would be breaking out of this one without some kind of sheer dumb miracle. Originally, it was made to lock up the most wanted criminals in the entire kingdom, in order to seal such beings. One of the girls asks if, now that they are behind bars, could the handcuffs be removed? Not a chance. They can't have the heroes going wild and killing each other. Once they were settled down, the cuffs would come off, but until then, they were stuck like that. It seems like they didn't want the heroes dead for some reason. Why is that? Because they were hostages, chimed in Ryuto, tied to the Mikard Empire. Ain't that right, Captain? The Empire was a suzerain state, a nation that controls another nation, of the Heroes' Alliance. If the other countries were to invade, the coup could say that they'll kill the heroes. They can thus buy enough time to reorganize their domestic affairs. Exactly, came the corrupted Captain's reply. But what was the matter with Ryuto? Did he get beaten so hard that he lost his cool head? Oh, not quite. The blood in his head felt cold as it rushed through the rest of his body. He can see a lot of things now. He's so furious and wants to defeat Izzy for everything she'd done. But that's the keyword he got wrong. He said defeat, not kill. That is why she kept calling him naive. If he didn't have the will to kill, he wouldn't make it in a battle against her. Eyes that have lost their light become muddy, dirty. Izzy recognized those eyes of Ryuto's. They were hers in the long distant past. The Elven Invasion Operation, 12 years ago. At the time, the necessity of the invasion was somewhat doubted. But despite that, many soldiers made a clear decision for the country. They went out, heading to the battlefield. She was the platoon leader on her first battle. The platoon was made of others who were practically her comrades, much like that of the Roman Legion in structure. For the 300 elves who were resistant, the Rising Sun Kingdom had sent a battalion of 1,000 people. Unable to resist, the elves would promptly surrender and so the invasion was enforced, a war with a great difference in powers. They'd probably let their guard down. 
In the middle of a fight, Izzy hesitated just a little bit when killing an elf, because the face of a small one fit underneath the helmet. A small yet significant gap is all there was. There were other factors, of course. However, that hesitation was the entire reason that her whole platoon was wiped. Just as with real-life platoons, they were brothers and sisters in combat, a unit forged in battle, training, and blood, a bond made by time. And the damage didn't stop there. The elves' resistance was incredibly strong for what little forces they actually possessed. The predictions of the nobles and royalty were completely wrong, and in a war that started out as an easy victory, out of five total teams, two were completely annihilated. One was partially destroyed beyond repair, and approximately 500 people died, with the rest being fatally wounded. Izzy no longer believed in her country, nor the reason she fought. Yet she continued her pillage despite her resentment to the nobility and royalty who had ordered this invasion. She was left completely alone. With nobody to ask for help, she abandoned all hesitation and just started killing mercilessly. She had received trauma from just the first battle and created the legend of her beginning. 400 years later, the title of the world's strongest had been attained. Before the operation, she had doubts about the necessity and danger of the operation, despite complaints being ignored by seniors over on the nobility side of things. There was a young company commander who stood in the front lines to protect his friends too, who then got injured and retired. Prime Minister Batley. If you think about it, this was a long and harrowing journey, and now there's only one step until the new revelation was completed. The new king had no time nor space to mess up now. Unfortunately for him, a smiling face of darkness in his chamber says otherwise. Inori beheads this new monarch, and as the guards turn around, all they see is blood flying from their former leader's corpse. And with that, the coup d'etat had utterly failed. But surely, those guards didn't think it was the end, right? Inori slaughters them en masse, each one feeling a profound and painful death. It's enough that they activate the shield of the guardian deity, which deploys a hemispherical barrier that doesn't block any attacks from their side. Oh, so it can disable all magic in this world, right? Yeah, all magic from this world. Inori is a being that defies this world's physics, one that ignored the natural law. A walking absurdity, one that would now finish off all the rest of these stupid guards who would dare oppose him. The knives have erratic and bizarre movements, ones that completely ignore the laws of physics themselves. They take lives in the dark and dusty walls, one after another. Slaughter has become the new normal. They have no blind spot. They will precisely chase their opponents no matter where they go. And, combined with true dark magic, the wielder would control them at his own leisure. Thus, nobody could escape from these knives. One of the guards pants wildly from behind cover, squeaking when his friend's head comes rolling by. How could this have happened? He was just the hero's entourage. He has the detection blessing. So Commander Izzy had her eyes on him. But beyond that, he should have been the weakest member of all the heroes. But the guards had never once heard of him having such unique and menacing abilities. His head is then cut off behind the shield, and Inori begins walking through a field of mangled corpses. He calls up his status window, and we learn that he's now level 13, with a whole host of new skills. A new title though, Trash Among Trash, catches his attention. Consuming 10 times the HP to regenerate damage during the day? No thanks, chief. That's pretty darn harsh, though from behind him Fenrir pipes up. How pitiful. Are those the knights who are protecting the witch country? He's to give the knights a break, since even he couldn't dodge the knives in the end. The wolf huffs and says that he did at least repel them all. Yeah, yeah, no need for competition with dead people. He has a job for Fenrir anyhow, which is to go and eat. Kill everything that can be killed, as his familiar sucking blood seems to count as him doing it himself. One of the outside guards later spots Fenrir above on the buildings. Suck the corpse's blood and turn it into a ghoul were Inori's direct orders. So that is what his minion shall do. Fenrir is a monster above all monsters, and it launches itself downward towards the guards outside to prove as much. With one foul chomp, it uses one as a chew toy, and many of the other guards ask why there's a monster in the castle as they group up in order to try and defeat it. No matter what they do though, it's a one-sided massacre which only ends in the guards' inevitable defeat. At first, he decided to kill everyone in the castle in order to stop Aaliyah's pursuers. His second reason was to now erase the fact of her escape. The best situation would be to make it as if zero survivors were present from the castle. And lastly, he would gain all the experience and knowledge of the guards by killing them, stealing their skills in the process. Throwing twin daggers around a corner like fangs, he lops off the head of yet another guard and watches as it tumbles down the stairs with morbid amusement. While walking, he's murdering anyone who enters the range of detection. He soon finds himself at the end of his murder walk, having crossed a huge section of the castle by now, and he finds himself at the entrance to the library. 
Inori does have some unfinished business here, so he enters the room and begins picking out some books. He had yet to learn the whole library secrets and wanted more information, as much as humanely possible, from this crusted old store of books. With clairvoyance, see-through, and photographic memory, he could store an entire book in his brain just by holding it. Even with this method, it'll still take him a lot of time to store the information. Half the books would end up in his shadow storage, ready to be used another day. Now, all that was left to do was check the final door of the library. Behind it, he finds a very scared man and woman, both of which look like nobles. She asks if he's not one of the knights, and no, Inori wasn't. The girl tells her father that he might be here to save them. The man then recognizes him as the hero's attendant, and asks for help from him as he never bribed anyone. He never did any of the nasty things he was accused of. He had only been set up by the evil prime minister, but Inori wouldn't be the ones to free them from the hands of the prime minister because there's no merit for him in doing so. He can give money, woman, even alcohol, but none of this was useful to Inori. What he wanted was to kill everyone in the castle, and you happen to be a part of everyone, Buster. The woman asks him what's so fun about doing that while she's shaking and sweating, crying even. Why did she ask that? Ah, must be the psychopathic smile on his face. Yeah, that ought to do it. Needless to say, he closes the door behind him and lets the fun of the killing begin anew. The battle made in unit, a regime of warrior women trained by Captain Izzy herself. They work directly under her and her alone. This unit makes the single best source of training if you want to fight their captain, let alone kill her. They walk the halls of the castle while asking themselves where exactly Inori had run off to, as he was nowhere to be found. Well, some of the knights did report that he ran away with the princess, though no further reports came to them after that. This was quite a troublesome predicament, as it seems they'd been ordered to bring Inori in. One of the girls wonders why their captain is so concerned by that guy. Another says that he's quite young and cute, you know. The other retorts back that she's not interested in young whelps. Anyone without a six-pack is out of the question entirely. Seems that Alice's preferences are pretty easy to tell. What about those of Alpha? Ah, right. Miranda had forgotten that she was devoted to Alec. The commander then calls that this was enough idle talk. The coup was almost completed, and it was still too early to let their guards down. But then, Alpha notices a face peeking at them out of the darkness dead ahead. And I do mean that literally, because it's just his dead head in Inori's hand, as her villain casually waltzes up to the battle maidens. This head wasn't just anyone, it was Alec, the person Alpha had a crush on. Uh oh, I can see where this is headed. My dark puns aside, Maria calls out asking if the man before them really was Inori, probably because he didn't look the part while covered in the blood of guards and nobles alike. Inori takes note that Alpha was infatuated with the head in his hand, and Maria says that they'll talk about what happened to Alec later and why he was holding the head. For now, their captain had asked that they take him into custody. But he says that it's fine. They can all talk here. He killed Alec along with many others. He decided to kill everyone and had already murdered all of the assembly hall. Is he saying that he defeated all of the knights in that hall solo? Yes, get the cotton out of your ears. She asks how he's still alive and why she can't pull out her sword, forgetting one of the lessons that she taught him during training. Pull your sword out immediately or abdominal pressure will keep it lodged there for good. He then cuts her throat with one of the flying daggers, and that's one down, three to go. They yell out their battle plan and engage Inori, the skilled mage Miranda and skilled archer Alice, covering for Vice Commander Maria. As expected of Commander Izzy's subordinates, Inori eventually leaps over Maria, who notices that while he's in the air, he can't dodge. Oh, is that so? He wraps his chains around the mage and pulls her toward him like a reverse bungee, and as Maria turns around to warn Miranda that Inori was coming her way, She's impaled on the ice spikes of her own creation ahead of them. Alice asked what the heck he did to pull that off, and she's soon trapped by the same chains that her friend was killed by. Inori's present for her would be the arrows that she so gracefully gifted him. Three dead, one more to go. Now then, all they need to complete the circle was Vice Captain Maria's corpse. She asks why he's doing this, and Inori just tells the truth. They were nothing but a warm-up for fighting Izzy. A warm-up? Well, too freaking bad, because she would be killing him right here and now. Dancing professionally with her blade, Inori can't help but feel that little urge again. The corners of his mouth rise into a shrill smile as the fight kicks off. Maria had cut him deep. If stabbing and shooting arrows don't work on this nasty vampire, cutting him to pieces might just work. Maria could do this. She could muster up all her courage and kill this guy outright. Inori fends off one of her attacks and says that it wasn't a bad one. Then he proceeds to knock Maria back without a care in the world. He can still do that much even though she'd cut off one of his arms? Wow, this Inori was a tough cookie. However, the battle is far from over. Noting that his first swing was a feint, Maria sidesteps his second one and tries to cut off Inori's head by the neck. 
Unfortunately, he expected this. He's caught her blade between two gloved fingers, and that was an almost instant loss. He also noticed this in training, but she tends to add feints to any opponents that can fend off her attacks. As long as he knows that, she was basically powerless to stop him with technique alone. Maria can't help but whimper and step back in a vow of fear and shock as she witnesses Inori's left arm, fully intact despite the stump she'd left it as. Too bad, it had already reattached. Now, they should really get back to playing, since it would be no fun if the warming up party was over too fast. Quite an evil thing of him to say. Needless to say, Maria loses the battle and Inori is annoyed that he didn't have to create a new steel sword as he could have fought with the black sword this well anyway. Oh well, back into his shadow it goes, and he's also a gentleman enough to thank Maria for participating in the warming up bouts. Quite a good opponent she was. Now she's trapped by the magical black chains that flow around her wrists and the pillar, holding her up in the air. She begs for a quick death, simply saying to kill her, but Inori tells her not to be like that because it spoils all the fun. Now then, he wondered if the ghouls had been completed yet. Oh honey, he wasn't asking you. He was asking the zombie corpses of your best friends behind you. That's right, the other members of her squad were somewhat alive, and Maria was going to be a part of a little experiment of Inori's. This was actually his first time commanding ghouls. It was time for them to eat. He had a fresh living human all ready for them. I'm not going to describe this scene because I'd like my food to stay where it is, but let's just say that Inori has had more than enough of a warm-up to go and fight Captain Izzy. While he looks around for Captain Izzy, one of the guards goes around looking at what had happened to all of his subordinates. He wonders what's with the corpses everywhere, making it seem like he's in hell almost. You might as well be, mate. Then, coming across Aaliyah, he has the horrible idea of trying to make sure she's dead. Cutting down with his sword, the impact seems to hit and spread more of Aaliyah's blood, but something happens to make his sword get thrown back and to the floor. Aaliyah's hair begins to turn black, while a black wolf prepares to launch from the shadows, taking out the guard with one easy bite. Aaliyah's wounds heal instantly, and the guard notes as he dies that the wolf came out of her shadow, the last thing he sees being the princess looming over him. He wonders what has happened to this country right before dying, and outside, Captain Izzy is awaiting her battle maiden squad. She wonders where the heck they are, as even if there was something delaying them, they shouldn't be returning this late with their experience. She'd be going against an order, but maybe she should return to the inside of the castle. She then hears a sound like flapping wings, and behind her comes Inori out of the pale moonlit sky, a full one right behind the vampire who presides far above her. Izzy can only stare for a few moments in confusion at the man before her, Inori, who comments on how the moon is quite beautiful tonight. She asks if it's really Inori, and yells up to him that those wings were the ones of a devil. Did he really sell his soul to Satan for power? What was he thinking? What happened to his honor as a human? She had trusted him. Trusted or pitied? And what nonsense was this about honor? He had none from the very beginning, and to answer her question, no. He never sold his soul to the devil because that would require him to submit to the devil's will, which was not something he would ever do. He was a man without honor, a former human who would use anything he could, and abandon anything he deemed useless. They were truly idiots, weren't they? For summoning a demon in the hero summoning. He had all this power from the very beginning? Lying wasn't a good tactic against her, you know. He was simply a fool who ended up relying on the power of a demonic influence to compensate for his own weaknesses. It's not too late. He could still turn back the clock. He's a faint-hearted person, so what exactly was he trying to achieve to the point that he would stop being human outright? What was his purpose for living the way of evil rather than siding with the rebellious good? Simple goals, really. He's living in order to survive. Izzy takes a few seconds to contemplate the words he's spoken. Not wanting to live or not wanting to die. Those kinds of feelings were quite fragile in execution. In this world, the stronger those feelings are, the more their lives would become exposed to danger. That is why they needed a strong reason to live. He could only go so far with having a reason like living to survive. Oh, is that so? Inori asks her that if that was true, what was the reason for things such as water fleas to live? Uh, bit out of left field, but okay then. The point is that they can survive much harsher conditions than all humans and they've probably never even considered the possible meanings of life, nor the machinations that come with such a daunting prospect. The problem here was that Izzy still saw him as a student, not as an enemy like he'd wanted. Alright then, what was her purpose of living? Izzy stumbles a bit over the words, going silent before repeating the question. The answer comes easily though, she's living for her country, that is where her soul is going. So in the end, what was her purpose for living? That's so boring. Inori stops caring as much, 
and starts to explain from his point of view that the meaning of life is to reject. Living is all about resisting the weathered effects of the outside of your shell, the outside world, and opposing it. Reasons are not needed in doing so. Uh, what? She doesn't understand what he's trying to get at here. She doesn't have to understand, he says. But simply, it's not that he wants to reject her. It's that he simply wants to oppose her. Izzy looks to each side as shadows rise from the concrete floor below her, simply from a small movement of Inori's finger. The visages of some very angry wolves stare at her from among the inky darkness, some with teeth bore and others with piercing gazes. Now then, he has a favor to ask the captain who cares oh so much for her country. Would she abandon it? Is he really asking her to betray her own country? Well, not quite, sweetheart, for you see, they were no longer in such a phase. The country she had once known is now no more. The wolves drag out several soldiers that Inori had captured along the way, all of which are put between the jaws of death as the wolves prepare to eat them alive. He'd not only beaten all the knights within the castle, but he had also captured the chancellor. She was legitimately the only one left. Speaking of which, she mentioned her purpose for living earlier was her country, yes? Her group had killed all of the royalty and nobles, bar Aaliyah, but he's not telling her that. And yet they had lost a one-sided battle against him thus far. Her purpose of living no longer existed. Though, as she can see, some of the knights were still alive. If she surrendered at once, then he would let them live. If not, you can bet your bottom dollar that they would die a painful death. Though, it'd at least be quick for the first guy. He then throws the remains of Maria to the floor and says that the fate of her comrades would depend on her decision. She then takes a moment of silence, one for each of the comrades of hers that Inori had killed so unceremoniously, and more for her comrades who are about to be dead meat. Oh, ho ho With one swoop of her blade, she clears the wolves in front of and around her, and then decides to give Inori the answer to his question. No, they would be sacrifices for the sake of her country. They are knights. She was sure that they were prepared to die even if in the cruelest way imaginable by any foe, including him. And Inori himself, who defeated the grand majority of these knights, was a threat to her country. Thus, to protect its people, she was going to eliminate him. Inori can't help but let out a confused smile as the corners of his mouth begin to rise anew. She no longer has a king nor an army, so what was there to protect? The short answer? She'd gone insane, and had probably been insane this entire time. She finally begins to acknowledge Inori as an enemy instead of a student, and with that, she unlocks Inori's true smile, one filled to the brim with killing intent. Inori sends three things towards Captain Izzy, his daggers, his wolves, and the ghoulified remains of her former comrades in arms. All she has to do to rid herself of all the foes is use her battle smarts and blades to carve through each, almost eviscerating Inori in the process. One of her blades has an overpowered ability called Absolute Slash, which will cut whatever the heck it touches while the other one has the ability of magic enhancement, which allows her to cast magic without the need for a fancy circle that goes with it. Her magic armor is also a force to be reckoned with, something engraved with the power of the former Rising Sun Kingdom. This is a custom-made manual version of the magic armor that the guards had used, making Izzy a force to be reckoned with on the battlefield. It possesses extreme maneuverability at the cost of having to manually pour in magic power. This means it cannot be used by just anyone. Inori has to be very careful from now on, because while the sword in her left hand and the armor was just as he was told, the right one is a problem. It's way too broken for him even to get a grasp on, and it's in the hands of his pure-blooded enemy right now, with no way in heck to make her let go. Above all, what he doesn't expect is the combination of effects from that equipment. Izzy chose armor that focuses on speed, and she only pours magic into her Zetsuzan no Tachi whenever she attacks with it. She was also blazing fast, meaning that it was hard to dodge. She can instantly engage the enemy with a speedy build of hers, and skillfully utilizes pieces of equipment that require high magic power. They call her the world's strongest for a reason. It's all made possible by her high magic control, and being able to dish out the maximum effect of the equipment she's been given, while using the least amount of magic power. It's a cheat weapon that should not be held by human hands, and yet here we are. As a result, no matter who the enemy is, nor what's coming towards her, she always has an option ready to engage them head on. If you get too close, she can just cut you to ribbons. If you stray too far, she can cast magic with her other sword without the need for a circle, thus eliminating any warning. Truly an absolute piece of perfection, the strongest human on the planet because of her wits and skill. But this actually ain't looking good. Even with his magic eye of vision and a level 4 dodge skill, he couldn't get away completely unscathed. She's also super cautious about anything that Inori may try and pull out of secret, so she destroys the blade in his severed hand as well. He throws eight knives at her, 
one of which is secretly coming from behind in order to backstab her, a technique that she hasn't seen ever before. And yet, it's sideswiped by her blade like absolutely nothing. Is she for real? What kind of absolute beast was he facing? She comments that she's never seen a throwing technique like this, and that he didn't look like he was going easy with the training during the day. Yeah, you could say he's awesome at night. She was also hiding her power though. He didn't know that she could use her magical power to do something akin to detection. He realized that from the protection of detection, did he? There were three layers of magic power surrounding her. The first and second layers were adjusted depending on her weapon's attack distance. The last layer is covering the entire training grounds. He doesn't know the full details of how she made it, but if this was something akin to his detection, then she had zero blind spots. The only downside was that this was not a perfect technique. Anyone with high perception would be able to notice the magical layers should they come into contact with them, so it's not suited for stealth missions. She's also noticed the amount of threads that Inori has looped through the battlefield, and while talking, he's trying to think of any attacks he can use against her. She most likely can't detect things that are underground nor indoors. If it were a surprise attack, she would notice it immediately and cut it down in an instant. She asks what the abilities of those knives and threads are, but it's something that he chooses not to answer. Instead, he summons the Fenrir in order to do battle. Two against one, huh? Does he not know the words fair and square? He does, he just doesn't care. Now that they were enemies, he'd use any means necessary in order to bring her down, and he couldn't be picky when facing the world's strongest. Fenrir launches its attacks, and Inori considers his options. The same trick won't work on her twice. In other words, if he wants to beat her, he only has one shot. The sword that can cut anything it touches would be a problem because it didn't require her to put power into her swing. Thus, Izzy could focus on swinging fast. She was a real force of nature, something that he would actually have to work hard on defeating. Despite Fenrir's best attempts, its spikes were all deflected without much effort on Izzy's part. This woman was a soldier in the truest sense of the word, and not someone that he could take on one-on-one -on -one so easily. No matter, at least for the time being, he'd made her focus on defense. He moves around the grounds with incredible speed darting to Izzy's side as she notices that he's begun to move. What is he planning on doing this time, she wonders. Inori goes as close as he can to a wall and draws a blade from his own shadow. Now coming towards her without any form of self-preservation, she yells that he's pulling quite the cheap move out of his repertoire, but it's not like he cares that much. A magical barrier deflects all of Fenrir's needles aimed towards her, and with that, Izzy can focus on the incoming Inori. But before Inori can do any real damage, his arm is cut off by the OP sword in one strike meaning that he now has no weapon at his disposal. She then turns the mithril blade to cut him up nice and good, noting that last time he'd shown a great regenerative ability when his right arm had been cut off. If Inori was certainly a demon, then they were all weak to mithril. She had a surefire way to kill him. That's where you're wrong, Miss Izzy. He's not a demon from your world, even if you do cut him, which is quite the hard thing to do, especially when she can't reach him. Just like he thought, she'd be using the pure mithril sword. Izzy can't help but gasp at the fact that the threads of his can shrink at will, and Inori is quickly reeled back to safety before any damage could be done to his precious body. He hadn't shown her his little trick after all, it seems, but now that she knows, it probably wouldn't work twice. She looks up at the lantern that his hand is now blocking, casting its ominous shadow over her body. Jaws suddenly appear underneath Izzy's feet, and with one big chomp, her leg is almost taken off by the power behind the bite. If it weren't for that armor, she would be short one foot right now, which isn't conducive to battle. Screaming out into the moonlight, she beheads the wolf that had come to Om Nom Nom her and pants a bit from the pain of her throbbing wound underneath the armor. Inori orders Fenrir not to let her recover, and the giant wolf begins to move swiftly under his master's newest orders. It leaps into the air and sends spikes raining down on her position with rampant aggression, not letting up the assault until it touched the ground. Izzy had just barely managed to dodge or deflect them all, saving her hide by virtue of her pure skill. Her wound was already beginning to close up, was this the effect of the pure mithril sword? Darn it! It was able to skip the formulation part of casting magic, but as a trade-off, it had reduced efficiency. This was his chance to do some massive damage to humanity's strongest. Izzy can't help but wonder if the Fenrir has unlimited projectiles, given how it's endlessly spamming them at her, and she looks at Inori in order to see what he's doing so she can keep tabs on the battle. A magic circle is cast from his eye of formation, right in her face. It's not the one of teleportation, but rather one of mental interference. Either way, it's cut clean through by the OP blade, and she asks what the hell that was. Guess you could call it something of a hypnotic technique. Inori can't help but laugh a bit at the current predicament the two of them were in. This little endless fight of theirs, while he dodged backwards and got out of Izzy's range of attack once more. 
As his knives are broken apart by the OP sword, she asks what he's laughing about while moving around in the arena. Laughing? Him? Huh. He hadn't even noticed that he may be doing such a trivial thing. It might be because he's actually having fun for once. He's having fun in battle? Yeah. Wasn't she also having a blast fighting a tricky opponent for the first time? Well, she guessed that it was just a little bit fun. The opportunity to duel someone as strong as herself didn't come across Izzy's plate very often. This was actually the first time she was facing a strong opponent since she'd been named the strongest human on the planet. A duel to the death against them. A duel to the death with them, certainly, it was pretty darn fun. As her slashes failed to land any hits, Izzy is told a bit of history from Inori, who says that back in Japan, the phrase, the moon is so beautiful, was also a prominent line for proposals. And to reply yes, he would have said, I don't mind if I die. Quite a peculiar culture, ain't it? Slashing at him again while dodging his attack, Izzy replies by asking if she got proposed to earlier, but rejected him. Yeah, no, that was never his intention. So would he prefer if she proposed to him? More dodging ensues. Well, even if she did, he would decline. She figured as much, but at this moment in time, it was the most exhilarating feeling he's ever had in his life. A magic circle suddenly appears behind Izzy, glowing runes and lines mixed together to form several shapes and colors. She turns around to slice it in half, trying to do just as she did previously, as Inori had predicted. That's because the mind interference magic circle is similar to a hypnotic technique in nature, as it needs to be projected into the target's line of sight, and there's always a delay when activating it. However, this wasn't the magic circle of mental interference. This magic circle was the one of summoning, and it was much faster than the previous one. That's right, the magic circle of mental interference was the perfect decoy for her. This was Inori's trump card. See, while Izzy's swings were focused on speed, they didn't have any strength behind them because they didn't need to. This means that with the right amount of it, Inori could simply grab and constrain her arm in order to stop the swing. This was the end for Night Captain Izzy. She would need to dodge in order to survive, but her legs wouldn't move the way that she wanted, and she can't use her right arm because Inori is way too strong for that. Even if she swung her left sword, his knives would reach her first. At this rate, she desperately uses a spell called Air Hammer on her left arm, making it come swinging at Inori, careening it directly into the vampire boy's arm at full speed. She used a destructive magic spell on her arm? How reckless. This cuts his arm in half, right down the center line, and it also manages to lop poor Inori's head right off his freaking shoulders. With this decisive move, Inori's body goes down while his decapitated head goes tumbling over the bricks, landing a fair distance away from its detached body. While Izzy reels from the force of what she'd just done to her own arm amidst a bloody rain. With her arm mangled beyond repair, Izzy walks amidst the flames of war towards Inori's presumed dead body, blood dripping from her left forearm. Her detection range makes sure nothing can surprise attack her, even the Fenrir who is adamantly against its master's decease. The giant black wolf growls with horrid teeth bared at her, sweat dripping from between its smooth fur. It tries in vain to attack the walking Izzy with a mouthful of fangs, bearing down upon her with the fury of a thousand angry men. But tis all for naught, it too is cut in half by Izzy's sheer might. The ferocious swing from the half-dead captain still enough to rend its flesh from bone. Izzy's hair swings in the moonlight as the Fenrir goes down for good in this battleground, dissolving into shadow while Izzy stands victorious over the several thousand cracked bricks of the arena. She coughs and throws up blood from the intensity she'd just gone through, not stopping for a solid few minutes at best. It seems this battle had taken a rather fine toll on her body. Panting profusely and staggering forward using her sword as a support, it seems that she's won, albeit at the cost of an arm and a leg, just as the old saying goes. Stepping forth in the humid moonlight towards Inori's head, she can't help but pick it up in her arms while staring into the cold, dead eyes. She claims that the demons are weak against Mithril, and no matter how high one's regenerative abilities are, they wouldn't be able to withstand a Mithril sword. She closes her eyes, thanking whatever deity was out there for a chance she had been given to take down such a horrific monster. In the end, she had proved humanity's strength and forever burning flame, but for now, it was time to go. She still had to make it into the castle somehow. However, before she can, something rapidly approaches her from behind to deal something of a surprise final blow. Inori's body? It seems that this fight wasn't over just yet. His disembodied head then speaks to her, telling that it is nothing more than a mere decoration for his body. Using two abilities of his at once with the whirlwind of force, he stomps on Izzy with the force of a gale and sends her flying things to leap and jump kick, both level 10. She crashes into the nearest wall across the arena with the force of a fright train, something not even her damaged armor may protect her from entirely. Two of his blades then dash towards the location from above, one slicing off her hand while the other knocks away her precious instant death sword. While Inori's body repairs itself from the damage sustained, 
Inori repairs himself by reattaching his head to his body, noting that in the battle with Fenrir, he was struck in the spine yet it didn't cause paraplegia. This meant that he didn't need his brain in order to move his body. Even in the rare event where his head flies off, his consciousness remains in his torso, where his heart is. As he had thought, a vampire's core is not in the head where the brain functions, but in the heart, where the source of blood is. Should Izzy have known this, maybe she could have won out in the end. Izzy says that this is an impossible situation, as all demons of this world were weak to Mithril. Yeah, that much was true. But note the key words there. All demons of this world were weak to Mithril. He was summoned from a different world, meaning his weaknesses were also different. So much for her presumed victory. Inori then admits, after Izzy claiming that it's her loss, that the fact he was even still alive was a miracle in and of itself. The only strong enemy he had fought thus far was Fenrir, and he lacked combat experience, which he'd been compensating for with his cheat skills, dynamic vision, comprehension, and tactics. This fight had actually made Inori realize that he was still inexperienced. However, at the end of the day, the one who survives is still the winner, and this was still his victory over her, the strongest that humanity had to offer up. She doesn't have that much MP left. She cannot strengthen her body, detect his presence, or even fight a good battle with him any longer. He's right. She doesn't even have enough power to stand up anymore. So what's he going to do? Is he going to kill her? Kidnap her? Do a very bad thing and discard her? Torture was also one of the options. Well, Inori considers his options for a minute. To claim Izzy as a slave. Such an option doesn't even exist to him. Even if Inori did such a thing, he wouldn't be interested in someone who would abandon their country, which in itself was an impossibility for Izzy. She wouldn't do such a thing when it meant her life to her. There's no point in making her a slave, and Inori says that he doesn't have such hobbies. She'd rather die than be humiliated. Was that what she was trying to tell him? No, she never said such a thing. She's just buying time at this point. Not for any reinforcements, but rather because she's not ready to give up on her country just yet. Inori can share her sentiment from that point of view at least, but he won't be stalled any longer. He'll kill her right here and now. So he was a vampire after all, huh? Indeed he is. She can tell what he's about to do, right? Everyone can. As soon as Aaliyah wakes up in the middle of the castle hallways, one of the wolves hands her a note from its maw for the former princess to read. It was from Inori, stating that he was going to kill everyone in the castle and she has two options. One, to come with him. Two, to abandon the thought of forgiving him and opposing him. To live or to die on this dark night, the choice was entirely hers. As Aaliyah looks around at her surroundings, we zoom out of the castle and back to Inori, who is now in front of the three heroes. Ryuto asks if he's here to save them, all bound up in a cage like helpless little runts. Well, in a way, yes, he was here to save them. But before that, he wants to tell them a fabricated truth. The riot this time is a coup d'etat raised by the Prime Minister and the Knight Commander Izzy. They slaughtered all the nobles in the castle, including the servants, the king, and the queen. The princess has also died among all the ruckus. They locked up the heroes that they had summoned from another world in a magically enhanced cell. And after that, an unrelated demon joined the fray. The demon threatened the knight commander to agree to his proposal, but they were rejected instantly, and they killed the knight commander. Wait a second, what did he mean by that? Ryuto doesn't even have time to finish asking his question before Inori uses his magic eye of formation to cast advanced mind interference magic. Then, using his weapon refining, he converts the cage to needles. Ryuto still has enough mental strength to ask Inori what he's doing. Uh-huh, but he can't resist commands. He doesn't look like he's someone with a strong enough mind to resist Inori's power. That's surprising. No, rather, he hasn't realized his own true nature. Anyhow, moving forth, using the power of the demon who killed the Knight Commander, the castle was burnt to the ground. Tamaki has no choice but to follow his directions to burn down the whole castle without leaving a trace behind while Aoi puts up a fireproof barrier around this whole underground room with all her might. The orders are understood and start being executed the minute Inori finishes speaking. Aoi puts up the fireproof barrier in no time, while Tamaki begins the flames, starting the destruction of the castle far above. The entire place explodes in flame, washing everything out and leaving zero traces that anything had happened here. The weapons that these heroes have been using all this time were designed for nothing but training purposes. The staff that he gave to Tamaki was nothing but a normal fire attribute support weapon. However, it was still strong enough to practically delete the entirety of the castle. The difference is clear as day and night. And even though Tamaki was engulfing the castle with overwhelming flames, Aoi can block the fire with her barrier without any support tools. They were both quite irregular. That is the essence of the cheaty power that the heroes of the kingdom summoning rituals get. When Tamaki is done with it, Inori continues that the demon who defeated the strongest human became overconfident. He released the heroes who were imprisoned in the underground cell and announced to them that he was the new demon lord. Next, he announces to them the truth, 
that they would most likely be rescued and questioned by the Macred Empire. When that happens, they will tell the Empire this truth. Though it's pointless to lie to them that Tamaki is the one who burned all the knights in the castle, the Macred Empire has an artifact that can detect lies after all. But if that were the case, telling them about Inori being a demon was also a lie, wasn't it? No, they don't need to worry about that part because it is the truth after all. And the final closing remark from Inori is that he, as the new demon lord, declares war. The hero's true enemy is the new demon lord, not the current demon lord. And on that day, the rising sun kingdom faded, ironically, with the rising of a new morning. With that powerful flame, both the corpses in the library would be burned to dust. With the world's current level of information management, no one would even notice if several corpses or the libraries were to disappear. What he's doing here is simply called evidence destruction. And then, the Macred Empire, who would hear the truth from Ryuto, would begin to be wary about the new demon lord that doesn't exist. He's also ordered Ryuto to tell them that the human cult Inori no longer exists. This will also be considered the truth, as they will think that he died in the incident, and they won't investigate any further. All that's left right now is to deal with Aaliyah. Aaliyah tells him that she wants to go, and he asks if she's sure. Aaliyah still feels a little conflicted, but she's finally attained her freedom from the kingdom and its castle. They don't think it's necessary to look back on the past. Hold your horses there. You may have attained freedom, but you're still a Nori servant. What does she think about this, as she hasn't given him an answer? Looks like when she's in this state, she can't excessively harm her master, which is him, and she needs to obey his orders to the fullest. So to answer his question in the memo, the answer is that she won't oppose him. That was her current answer. There is a way to remove the servant state. To put simply, if she becomes stronger than her master, the state will be automatically removed. Is that even possible? Either way, she doesn't plan on being his servant for her whole future. So where would they head now? Inori hadn't decided yet, but he maybe wants to go to a country that didn't summon any form of heroes. Well, about that, there were 12 human countries in total. There weren't any that didn't summon any heroes. Ain't that a bit too many? They did go as far as being called the Hero Army, after all. Let's see now, 12 times 3, that's 36 heroes being summoned. Well, how should he put it? The summoned heroes were way too many. Asking where this was, Baitley recalls the last thing he saw was Inori's face as he got killed. Baitley is then told by some mysterious force that he must atone for his sins. For him to have killed two of his own kind is the same as killing 2,590 people. Oddly specific. Furthermore, his death did not contribute to the development of the human species. Therefore, in the name of God themselves, he is sentenced to 2,590 years of cleansing in hell. Baitley says not to mess around with him, and he says when did that God save people? For he is a child of the witch, and if it was her judgment, then he would accept it gracefully but he would never accept the condemnation of this god. The massive creature writing something on a giant notepad stops dead, rising above Baitley before appearing to him. Was he mocking their chief god? What oh Baitley gets forced into the ground and called a lowlife for the insult of not willing to recede to god's punishment. He's to kowtow, a Japanese form of respectful bow, and weep, scream for forgiveness. What's wrong? Why isn't he shouting, pleading for his life? Well, someone doesn't think he can, for that one has passed out. The chief god steps into the scene, ordering that he be punished severely for a mere 10 years. The creature does as it's told, throwing Baitley into the door on its mount while asking on what business the chief god has come. There's a distortion in the world, caused by factors from other worlds that have no connections to this one. Multiple overlaps are creating distortions. She wishes to use the door for a moment to investigate the cause, but while this is happening, an army of cloaked monsters has gathered in front of a pile of dead bodies, along with a woman who looks like some kind of Elphes. A giant man is summoned from the pile, someone they call Ignor, the demon lord of the first age. But the Alphas woman makes the mistake of trying to attack this behemoth of a man, and their hand starts bleeding out of sheer nothingness. Why was she trying to attack him? What was this feeling welling up within her? Hostility? No. Killing intent? And it's not just her, but everyone else as well. But they don't understand. Why would they want to kill the demon lord? Either way, he names her the demon lord, and walks away from the scene. When asked what he's going to do, he ponders for a moment just as the chief god enters the doorway. One was going to correct the world, the other was going to destroy it. Meanwhile, in the mortal plane that Inori is situated in, we get a look at all his unique and general skills while him and Aaliyah rest in a random hut out in the woods. The skills he got should have been the best skills they had before they died, or so he thought. Meanwhile, poor Aaliyah had thought that when Inori said she was becoming his slave, he meant something dirty with the connotations that it brings. Huh, <laughs> no. He has no desire to commit such crass acts and he would be making her some decent clothing tomorrow. It was getting cold outside, so they should probably go under the blankets. 
Didn't he just say he wasn't going to be naughty with her? Well, he's planning on strengthening every skill with some notable exceptions. He wants to try out the naughty act skills that he got from one of the people in the castle. Yeah, we'll leave that there. The next day, Aaliyah has a fully custom dress made for her. A perfect fit to her body. How come the size was so perfect? Because he knew her measurements from the other night. Well, he also has another gift for her. A Zetsuzan Kurotachi. A sword of triple S quality that cost 1 billion del. In addition to being a replica of Izzy's blade with modified abilities, the blade itself has been strengthened and could grow and regenerate by sucking blood from its worthy victims. Inori couldn't use the blade though. He was glad he could make it, but he can't use all of his own magical tools. Maybe because he has no connection to the magical power of this world. Well, since Aaliyah was a genius, she'll probably get the hang of the sword sooner or later. But he's aware that her plan is to break free from his control, right? Yes, but before that happens, she's still his servant. That's why she has to be strong. If her corpse was analyzed, they might find his own weaknesses. He was also more than happy to welcome her opposition, you know. Alright, first things first. She should get used to being a vampire. Then they would try becoming adventurers in another country. We start in Lean, a remote town in the Holy Land of Regin. Bustling streets and archway architecture keep true to the namesake and lean over the land and into the mountain, full of caravans and people alike. Although it is a remote town, it's well served by trade roads and paved with bricks. The streets are crowded with peddlers and customers. It is a local town centered on commerce where the lights of magical tools glimmer, and an adventurer's branch awaits two people. Most of the adventurers in this town are skilled and competent. That's why the regulars who visit the guild are usually the same. A man and a woman enter the bar in cloaks, but the adventurers here have never seen them before. Newcomers in town, huh? One of said onlookers is an idiot who chimes into the young lady that this ain't the grocery store, so if she's running errands, she can go somewhere else. Most of the people call him an idiot, and the guy stands up to go face to face with them. Don't tell me you're really here to be an adventurer, young lady, he chimes, saying that hunting monsters while being protected by your guardians wasn't the way adventurers did things. This guy seems to be cruising for a bruising real fast. He was one to speak though, big rookie. Black roses, um, yeah, I can't say that word. But suffice to say, they don't like him very much. The onlooker asks if they're ignoring him, as this was Black Rose's territory. The woman that he pulls the cloak off turns around to stare at him with annoyed eyes. Was she looking down on him? Heck no, he'd need to teach them a lesson. Oh, this ain't gonna end well. Yep, one hit KO from the braided beauty. The pimp guy goes crashing back into a table of drinks, and Fanatic, the woman, is asked what the heck she's doing. She instinctively fought back, huh? That's alright though. The Adventurer's Guild won't get involved in disputes between adventurers so long as no actual weapons are involved in the fighting. Or so the attendant says, but the pimp can be grateful that Fnatic held back. My dude is stupid enough to demand another fight outside this time, but the door opens and in comes the one known as Black Rose. They sigh and say that their follower here has done something inexcusable, and she apologizes on their behalf. Fnatic is shocked and says that she doesn't have to apologize, but Black Rose takes no heed of her words and says they are deeply sorry regardless. They will have to take him to be re-educated. Following the words that if it were them, they would just dump him. We learn that Black Rose is Aaliyah. The one who causes the actual trouble here was Inori, who seems to have done it just for the kick of things. Since when they registered as adventurers, they didn't have any ruckus around them. Why didn't he just create one himself? Aaliyah asks if she can then hit him once just for the kicks, and he says no because with her current status, she'd straight up kill him. It is daylight after all. It's also been a week since they've been here in Regan and it seems that Inori wasn't planning on staying in this town for that long. Getting a regular job here was out of the question, it seems. He didn't know much about this world to do business, and he didn't have much faith in Aaliyah either, because she hardly left the castle. He'd prefer a job so simple even an idiot could accomplish it. Thus, adventuring it was. Well, when he says we became adventurers, he means that Aaliyah did all the heavy lifting. And before he knew it, she was so famous that she'd earned the nickname of Black Rose, and she apparently had some kind of fan club. Her vampire tendencies were a little different from Inori's though. One might even call her a daywalker. She can go and do anything in the daytime without any setbacks. This makes Inori quite jealous of her, though he has an all-important job too. That of drinking, sleeping, and lazing around. Just kidding. He's actually gathering information from the bar, able to catch all the conversations with his super hearing, including things that he'd rather not hear, like people picking on him for doing the aforementioned. Nighttime was as usual. He snuck out of town in order to gain experience from blood-sucking the creatures he came across. But just while he's getting to the good parts of his information gathering, the door to the bar opens and in comes that girl, Fnatic. She searches the crowd thoroughly with her black eyes before spotting Inori, beginning a triumphant march all the way over to him. What the heck was she doing here today? 
Slamming her hand on his table, she claims that starting from today, he was going to be her disciple. Oh really? Disciple? What the heck was this lady thinking, let alone announcing to the whole darn bar? To the guy that messed with her, the one that she actively punched out of her way, for God's sake. Does she have a few screws loose? This woman's eyes speak nothing but trouble to poor Inori, who just wants to sit and drink alone in peace. If he hadn't caused any trouble, maybe he wouldn't be in this predicament. But the most troublesome thing is what her gaze speaks of. Rehab, teach, train, correct. Why was she doing this to him? Simple, his eyes. What? Oh, he may not have been able to respond to her attack in time, but he could still follow it with his magic eye of vision. That was the blunder that caused her to think that he may have some kind of skill after all. He had thought of her attack as something amazing, so he leisurely followed it with his magic eye. He didn't know, however, that he would attract the attention of someone so troublesome. She claims that muscle strength can be compensated for with magic tools. But eyesight and dynamic vision is something that not everyone has. It would be a shame to let those talents remain buried like this. While she does speak quite passionately about such things, being her disciple was already way out of the question. It's weird that she didn't already realize his master-disciple relationship with Aaliyah at the drop of a hat. But just as Inori is about to decline, the other adventurers pipe up that this is a good opportunity for him. Why doesn't he learn what it takes to be an adventurer from her? The others say that since he'd already lost so badly though, they ought to just let him drink in peace. Inori loudly states that he's already a disciple of Black Rose, so there's no need to go out of his way to learn from Fnatic. But then she asks a really simple question which throws him off his game. Isn't Black Rose quite busy right now? And there it is! She hit the nail on the proverbial coffin. And now comes the time where he needs Aaliyah the most, but she ain't there for him. Well shoot. The receptionist then pipes up that the guild would be grateful for the help. See, Inori had been drinking away without taking on any commissions, which is what they call a disgrace to the guild. He is something that they should have dealt with on their own, and they are very sorry to impose Fnatic, a problem that should be handled by them. So, she draws up a quick and crude request, stating that's a nomination one from the guild to rehabilitate this person. Inori, you done goofed, my man. Fnatic instantly takes on the request from the guild. Darn it, he can't handle all this pressure. He needs something, anything to turn the tide here. But when even his old drinking friend Brutus abandons him to the wolves in this scenario, Inori knows that he's completely fluffed. If Inori refuses at this point, when he's been walking as close as he can to the edge, his reputation would be the last line that he'd cross. Thus, he has zero choice but to accept her training regimen. She introduces herself as Fnatic, Lean's Holy Knight. Inori can just call her Fana. Inori then introduces himself as Kiri, but for the sake of simplicity, I'll keep calling him Inori instead of his alias. Pretty soon though, Inori is lying in a cratered mess, asking himself how such a thing happened to him. Even that brain-dead commander Izzy had started with muscle training, yet this girl was quite literally nuts. She gives some half-baked conclusion about why Inori could train without a magic tool, as he can't use one since his power was from another world, and about how she was just trying to get his capabilities by sparring with him in the first session of their training. Well, as his new master, she won't tolerate this kind of lazy attitude any longer. They should get back to training as soon as possible. With the 25-hit combo, she bonks Inori on the head and once he's drenched in the wall, she says that should do it. They could take a break for now. We then get a short explanation of what a holy knight is, basically a priest capable of combat. But what's this? Inori hasn't ever visited the church in town? Blasphemy! They must go right now! When they get there though, her tone changes as she teaches Inori how to pray. Each of the five fingers represents a god. Earth, fire, light, wind, and water respectively. Spreading out fingers was worshipping all the gods. Finally, the prayer ends with kissing your middle finger, representing the chief god. But the moment Inori starts praying, something odd happens. A feeling connects to his soul. A one-sided prying that reaches in and tries to snoop around within Inori. It doesn't matter who it is, he doesn't like it. So he forcefully cuts the pass, and one of the gods is surprised that he can do so. The water goddess far above in the pearly gates of heaven thinks her job is quite boring indeed as her duties are to monitor and manage the world through the church and sacred artifacts. This wasn't a task that a single god could accomplish alone, but that is exactly why she was chosen. She can create endless clones of herself in order to do the work. She has no complaints about the work, or the chief god who entrusted it to her, though no god should be doing a plain desk job as far as she's concerned. No matter how talented she is, this tedious work has been going on for tens of thousands of years. While her job is boring at least until someone cuts her off at the pass forcibly, her clones are in shock and they're ordered to hurry up and investigate the cause. The place is the Lean Holy Land, within the Regan Church. And this human who cut her off has 8 world factors? Originally, cutting off the past was impossible for ordinary humans. Even so, this is too extraordinary. Humans were created by God, 
and it's difficult for humans to have more than one world factor already. Sometimes a rarity will attain two. There's no mistakes in the information, and this means that Inori crossed eight separate worlds before being sent to this one. The chief god said that there's even a distortion in the world, and this means that Inori is the potential cause. Even the chief god is surprised by the news of eight world factors, but what caused him to have eight of them? Is it originally a higher being than the distortion of the world? No, that wouldn't happen unless it's caused by a hole in the world. No wonder the chief goddess couldn't find it. But how could a human being cause such a distortion? The person's name seems to be Takafuji Inori, and he's currently in the holy land of Lean within the town of Regin. The chief goddess had heard that name before though, from the live veracity sacred artifacts of the Makad Empire, the one that rescued Ryuto. They had said that the person named Takafuji Inori no longer exists. If that were the case, the artifact wouldn't have seen it as a lie, because maybe Inori wasn't a human anymore. Disguises. Those lower beings are really cunning. Maybe they should send the fire goddess? She should be more than capable of handling Inori, but that would also count as over-interfering with the world below. Then, are they just leaving him alone? Nah, of course not. It's fine as long as they don't over-interfere. As long as they don't do anything direct, that's all that matters. Meanwhile, Inori wonders what the discomfort was all about. It's as if it was all a bad dream now. But something was definitely trying to find out who he was. Who is it and for what purpose? Even his detection ability couldn't tell him who it was. Encountering a blessing? That's not something easy to do. Should he use the blessing in the same way? Or maybe use a magic tool comparable to an artifact? Or maybe... His thoughts are interrupted by Fnatic coming up behind him, saying that she was scared of him. When he started praying, his expression became so serious. She couldn't believe that he'd been praying so passionately. He must have a lot of faith in the deities. Inori then wonders, was it a god praying into him? Hypothetically speaking, if the gods of this world were using the churches as conduits to investigate the world, and taking that information to manage the world, then he might actually be in a pinch. If he had something connected to him to search for everyone in the chapel, there's a good chance that cutting it off would have alerted them to his presence. But if he hadn't cut them off at the pass, then all of his information could have been ascertained by the gods. This was a risky game he was playing. Sitting with his old drinking buddy, Inori notices that this old man is for some reason despised by everyone in this guild. And no matter how crowded the bar is, people always avoid his table. He's not aware of what the old timer did in the past, but it's convenient to have a seat where nobody gets close to you. But just when Inori thinks he's safe from the clutches of Fnatic, who should walk in but the lady herself, knowing exactly where he'd be? He tries to say that he'll be under the training of this old timer adventurer from now on, but again, he's abandoned to the wolf who had just come in. Inori doesn't want to train with Fnatic because she's utterly ruthless in her methods, and she never gives him a proper break but it doesn't seem like the person who just walked in would either. Aaliyah arrives on the scene, and she's not happy that she's doing all the work while Inori is just spending all day flirting. Good luck, buddy. You'll need it. Within the intensity of his situation, Inori notices that Aaliyah's legs were swaying back and forth ominously. For a split second, a scene from a few days ago is recalled in his mind. Aaliyah asks what happened and what all the fuss was about, and she's told that he got kicked in the junk in public. Poor dude got KO'd. A lover's quarrel is frightening, eh? Wait, why is Aaliyah practicing? Let's just say all that practice was worth it when she knocks Inori's lights out by the same tactic. That just hurts to look at. Fnatic is surprised, and the rest of the patrons are shocked for poor Inori's family jewels. Aaliyah asks what the heck is going on here next, after taking out her rage on him. You really should have asked that before you kicked him. Anyhow, she notices the victim from the other day, Fnatic, and the assailant who got what he deserved. She sighs and asks if Inori did something again and he thinks that she has zero trust in him at this point. The receptionist comes forth to explain things to her. A disciple, huh? While Aaliyah says that she appreciates the sentiment, he is her problem come the end of the day. But Aaliyah hadn't trained him well enough yet, had she? That's sadly true. Fnatic is sure she can take good care of him. That's not a bad thing, is it? Aaliyah tries to pull him out of her grip by his leg, saying that she'll make sure he doesn't have any more immature outbursts. Fnatic holds on to him, asking if she's really that attached to Inori. Oh, was she perhaps in love with him? What? Where the flying heck did she draw that conclusion from? Aaliyah lets go and suddenly Newton's third law sends him careening over tables, knocking mugs and stools alike around in a flurried frenzy. There were zero romantic feelings between them, more like thoughts of bloody murder for each other. If Aaliyah doesn't have any sort of romantic relationship with him, then there shouldn't be a problem with the Holy Knight toughening him up a little bit. She says to worry not, as she doesn't see her disciple as the opposite sex because she's a Holy Knight. And with Aaliyah's consent, Inori is dragged back to hellish training. Out of town a few days later, 
It seems that Inori is venting stress from what he's gone through during the daytime by flexing his power over the trash mobs in the area. Skeletons, zombies, you know the type. The reason for this is also because he's sleepy. He can't sleep during the day like a regular vampire can, because of his training with Fnatic. He's obviously not happy with how things turned out. His level never seems to go up anymore, and while he has his complaints about it, he can still suck blood from what he kills along with the bone marrow. A mysterious voice comments that this was quite interesting. His detection can't find anything within range, meaning that either the individual who spoke is a great distance away from him, or they were communicating with magic. Inori asks where their manners are, since they can't just call out to people like that. They apologize and introduce themselves as Faruth, but rather than know their name, Inori wants them to tell him more about this trick they were using. He can't sense any kind of magic being used, nor anyone near him. They speak as if they're not human, and on top of that, they also know about Inori's abilities from observing him eat that skeleton from a few minutes ago. Normally, he'd shut her up then and there, but since he can't seem to detect where the voice is coming from, that's a really tall order. But this works two ways, as it doesn't seem like they can directly see Inori either. The voice then says that they will meet again, next time in person. Back in the bar, Inori laments that during the day he was pushed around by a violent sister, and at night, he was disturbed by an unknown spirit user. His intention was to relieve all the pent-up stress by hunting monsters that night, but it turned out to be an even bigger source of anxiety than before. But while he's lamenting the loss of his true identity to a hidden thief, a new presence enters the bar, someone who comes straight for him. While Inori is too sleepy to do any scenarios in his head, the presence seems to call out to him. And then? Okay. Then someone is real touchy. Inori tells them to let him go, asking who it is. And the woman says not to be like that. Not after that hot night they just shared. Uh, best of luck? 